No, oh, let's mute that. Hey, Fred, can you say something so we know if your microphone's working when you unmute? Yes, I, I, yeah, I checked this out a little while ago. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Marshall, um, it is 6.33. You do have a quorum. The attendees are joining us. I see Amherst Media is in the house. Um, I am about to make you, yourself, the co-host. I think we are good to go. All right. Thanks, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of December 20th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, when I, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colham. I'm here. Fred Hartwell. I am here. Jesse Major. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Present. And looks like Karen Winter has joined us. Present. Thank you. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the time now is 6.36, and our first item on our agenda is minutes. And Pam or Chris, I didn't see any minutes in the uh, packet that I was mailed. Am I correct? There are none tonight? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam. All right, uh, moving on to general public comment period. Let's see. How many attendees we have and who are they? Okay. Um, I see 10 attendees and I will read the names. 
We have our liaison from council, Pam Rooney, someone just designated as Andrew, Claire Bertrand, David Zomek, uh, first name Grace, uh, Jack J, Jennifer Mullins, Karen Sanchez Epler, Marilyn Billings, and Maura Keen. So at this time, I'd like to ask uh, the public if you want to make a comment for during this public comment period. A uh, reminder, it's for things not on tonight's agenda, so it should not be about the Hickory Ridge project. And um, I see one hand uh, from Pam Rooney. Pam, let's bring Pam in. And uh, Pam, I guess I need you to give us your name and your address, even though many of us already know you. Thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I'm just speaking as um, a person living on Cottage Street. Um, I was thinking about the University Drive project. I know that it's on your agenda tonight, but I may not be able to um, stay on the meeting that long to get to it. And it occurred to me that there was some really good discussion about um, if there was an overlay district of any sort, that um, the idea was floated of five-story buildings. Currently, there are three stories allowed in much of that area. And it occurred to me that um, it would be a really wonderful opportunity to utilize um, the gift of an additional two floors or two stories to these buildings uh, if there were some conditions that were imposed to, um, to obtain something for the town and the conditions that might be imposed mm -hmm. in order to gain a couple more floors of, of height and, and income uh, would be that there might be um, the opportunity for some mid-level, mid-income housing and family housing that's incorporated into the design of the facilities. So it's just something to think about um, rather than giving away the store uh, with the first with the first pass, having some condition for um, um, allotting or gate or adding two floors to the project might be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, I don't see any other hands uh, from any of the public. So I'll wait just a few more seconds if anybody wants to raise their hand. Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. All right, so the next item starting now at 640 uh, is a public hearing on a site plan review. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purposes of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. These public hearings are continued from November 15th and are uh, 2023 and are opened simultaneously for the purpose of discussion. So Pam, uh, that text was incorrect, was it not? Sure was. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, not correct. This is a single public hearing. It is not mm -hmm. continued from a previous date. Nope, sorry and about that. I should have read this earlier to see if I had any <laughs> mistakes or questions. <laughs> I okay. should have done a better job. I'm so sorry. So it is a single um, site plan review public hearing. It has been duly advertised and you are right. We are opening it tonight for the very first time. Right. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Okay, so I'm not losing my memory. Okay, so this is SPR 2024-03, Town of Amherst, 191 West Pomeroy Lane. Request site plan review approval to install two ADA universally accessible six foot wide crushed stone paths, accessible footbridges and other site improvements, including boardwalks, benches, signage, kiosks, bike racks, shade structures, upgrades to existing parking area, and a connector path, 
under Article 3, Section 3.335, and Article 8 of the Zoning Bylaw. Um, in the RO and RN uh, zoning districts, in the flood prone conservancy district, and the FEMA over floodplain overlay district, map 19D and parcel 10. So do we have any board member disclosures on, of this project? Don't see any hands related to that. So with that, we can go on to our applicant presentation. And I guess I'll suspect that it's Dave here to introduce the topic. Welcome, Dave. Great. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, happy to be here tonight. I'm also joined by Jennifer Mullins, our permit administrator, and Jennifer was instrumental in pulling this application together. And um, I or other staff members may refer to Jennifer this evening, um, but we're happy to be here. I think um, I just wanted to remind Nate, I think uh, when we uh, turn to some of the diagrams for the presentation, I think, Nate, are you prepared to kind of uh, run that show a little bit while I speak? Yes, great. Well, thank you very much for having us tonight. We're excited to be here to, and really this kind of kicks off, um, you know, the beginning phases of the planning process for the former Hickory Ridge Golf Course. I just wanted to give a little quick background and then get into the project uh, that we're here to talk with you about tonight. But just for the public listening and for the board members, um, very quickly, um, you know, the town a few years ago did move forward and purchase the 150-acre Hickory Ridge Golf Course, a very exciting and, and probably once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for, for the town to acquire this, this uh, incredible property with over a mile of frontage along the Fort River. And we did so with a number of goals in mind. I won't go into great detail on all of those. Um, the project, did, I should state right out of the gate, that the project did come with uh, solar already assumed on the property. So the former owners had already uh, really struck a deal uh, that there would be 26 acres of solar uh, on the property. And as you know, that property has already gone through um, many boards and committees in town and is under construction right now. So there will be 26 acres of solar. Uh, we, we have two uh, uh, pads, if you will, a central and a western pad of solar, and that um, uh, project will be um, uh, moving forward in earnest in, in 24. So the town acquired the property with multiple purposes. A large, uh, a large part of our, our interest in the property was connectivity to try to help uh, those residents uh, to the living to the north of the property and to the south of the property uh, in a number of apartment complexes, uh, uh, Mill Valley, the Renew, the Boulders, as well as Orchard Valley to the south to really reconnect with this incredible piece of property. So at the current time, my staff and I are developing a comprehensive plan, which will include a number of different elements of the development of this property. But um, we had a, a couple of opportunities um, early on to get funding to implement one phase of that plan, and that is to get going on the, the connectivity piece. And so we were fortunate to apply for and receive a park grant to um, uh, build, construct, design, and construct an ADA accessible loop trail, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And then we were also fortunate enough to get CDBG, Community Development Block Grant funding through the town for what we're calling a north-south connector or a core trail that will connect those residents living to the north uh, in the neighborhoods to the north with the, vi uh, the budding village center down at Pomeroy uh, Village Center. So um, with that, Nate, maybe um, I could ask you to put up the trail map and Nate will... Uh, as I speak, I think he'll kind of take us around the the uh, the property. Or Pam, do you have that ready? I was downloading all the documents, but I realize there's quite a few of them. You might just have to um, remind me, like, which document is which. This is okay. So 
Is it? I was trying to figure out the trail map would be. The trail furnishings. Um, Probably the site map is what I'm guessing as the. Uh, do you see it? This right down here? Yeah. Is this the one? Right, Dave, that's what you're considering the trail map? That is not the annotated one, Nate, that you developed. You notice there are no there are no numbers on it. Whoops. We'll wait just a moment here to see if we can. There we go. Yeah, pretty starting. Okay. That's and if you oh, could okay. just bring that up a little, Bam, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And then, Nate, are you able to control the cursor? Can you get it, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I'm not, I guess we'll have to see where, what, Dave, how you're, what you're, um, when you're talking, I can, you know, annotate or do things that yeah. you're speaking. Yeah. Well, why don't we just start with a brief orientation to the property? And um, so I think we're the, the, the proposal before you orients um, uh, from the parking lot off of West Pomeroy Lane, um, which is in the lower center portion of your screen and this image. Um, and uh, it has a very, you know, Pickery Ridge has a very large existing parking lot. And so um, our plan is to develop at least part of the trail system around that existing parking. The former clubhouse just to the west of that will eventually be demolished, but for the mean, in the meantime, it will remain on the site until we're able to get funding to remove that structure. So our goal here is twofold. One is to create um, a trail system from that parking lot, uh, and, that, and we're calling that the loop trail, and that begins at the parking lot. It's a six foot wide crushed stone, um, um, stone dust trail. Uh, it uh, meets or exceeds all ADA uh, requirements for slope. And it will basically take visitors on this loop that Nate is now following. And if any of you, just to give you a sense, if any of you have been to the Conti Refuge in Hadley on Moody Bridge Road to their trail system, part of that trail system is a crushed stone path the remainder of that trail system is actually an elevated boardwalk uh, with uh, pressure treated lumber. Most of this trail will actually be a six foot wide crushed stone trail. We don't have a lot of elevated systems uh, uh, sections. Uh, so the loop trail includes uh, three small bridges or two bridges and one boardwalk. Number one is an area of wetland and a stream crossing. We're proposing to install a bridge there that will double as both a pedestrian bridge, but also a bridge that will hold small vehicles like conservation trucks and uh, mowers. And then as you loop around toward the Fort River toward number two, we need to span a short wetland there. And so there will be a, a slightly elevated boardwalk there to safely traverse over the wetland, but also to protect the wetland from impacts of of human traffic, if you will. And then number three is a very small bridge um, that will be installed uh, after we remove a culvert. Um, and that bridge will just be a pedestrian, a simple bridge. And I believe in your packet are the plans for uh, those three structures. I want to point out that um, a fundamental element of all of this work is ecological restoration. So we are removing a number of culverts in, in all of these areas. Our goal would be to remove culverts that have impacted the um, natural flow of streams and wetlands uh, that are trying to move water toward the Fort River. So as we go, we'll remove the culverts and replace them with bridges uh, that give um, wildlife <laughs> a chance to move more freely, but also water uh, and reptiles and amphibians that that depend on that water as well. So that is the loop trail. Um, I wanna call attention before we go to the north-south trail 
I want to call attention. We do have a schematic in your packet. We will be improving the parking area uh, that Nate could outline. And I believe that schematic was in that plan is in your 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 packet. Um, it will include crack sealing the parking lot um, and defining the parking lot, re relining, repainting the the various um, um, parking areas, parking spaces, as well as yes, this is a good place to start. So what we're doing here is. Uh, Nate, perhaps you could show us the, the current main entrance to the former clubhouse is in purple. And our goal here is to, to move um, from a safety standpoint and an aesthetic standpoint. Our goal here is to move visitors away from the clubhouse, if you will. So we're going to redefine the parking. The entrance will now be in brown where Nate's cursor is. We will have uh, visitors enter come down the hill there, park. There will be ADA parking um, spaces clearly designated. We're going to be crack sealing the parking area. And then we're going to be creating a, a walkway on the northern end of the parking lot to get people to the main entrance to the trail. There's the layout. There we go. And so we'll we'll create this space between parking and pedestrians away from the building with Jersey barriers for the time being. Um, and that way we can create some safe distance away from the building uh, for those folks coming to, uh, to, to visit the area. So that's the loop trail along the way. Uh, we'll have benches, we'll have signage, there'll be an entrance kiosk that will welcome people to the uh, conservation recreation area. There'll be information about the trails, contact information, rules and regulations, um, et cetera. And then along the way will be ADA benches. Um, we are also proposing uh, on the property two uh, areas where there in the future there will be uh, shade structures or gathering structures. Perhaps Nate, you could show where those are on the loop trail lower left right there and then the star indicates where the entry kiosk will be near the parking lot and along the way and I think they're blue they're a little small on my screen are bench locations so there'll be one two three four six uh, five benches on that loop and then we're proposing additional benches throughout the rest of the trail system. So perhaps I should stop here, if that's OK with you, Doug, before I talk about the North-South Trail. Oh. Um, OK. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to keep going. And yeah, I think, I think you should point. go ahead and do the whole thing. And then we can okay. have the site visit report. And OK. You know. so. The second uh, part of this first phase is trail connectivity for those folks coming from the north. And so what we are proposing using CDBG funds is a trail that comes from the northern edge of the property all the way down right through the core of the property, if you will. It hugs the, um, the side of the solar array. It then, so in red, and then Nate, if you could back up, you're going a little too fast for me there. Uh, it then jumps on to an existing road, uh, crushed stone, crushed gravel road at number five, crosses the Fort River, and then picks up the remainder of the trail headed over to the east, um, does another stream crossing over the Plum Brook, and then we're going to utilize up near number seven, we're going to utilize an existing road that is an access road that our DPW owns, the town owns, to service a, um, a sewer pumping station at about number seven. And that road will take people out to a brand new uh, six or, or eight foot wide um, sidewalk on West Street. So that is the proposed route to get people to the village center, which is just slightly down the uh, down the street from Nate's 
uh, cursor. All right. Um, I want to I want to call out. Eventually, in a second phase, we will connect these two trails, and Nate can take and show you. So eventually, we would like to connect the loop trail with the north south trail. We don't have the funding for that right now, um, but that would be a phase two um, in this process. Again, these are six foot wide trails, crushed stone or bituminous pavement. All would be at 5% grade or less. We would have benches along the way, informational kiosks, et cetera. So why don't I stop there and open it up for questions? All right, uh, Chris, I see your hand. Do you want to? Yeah, I ahead? just wanted to ask Dave to show where the other sh uh, shade structure might be located in the future. Nate's cursor is on it, I believe, right now, right there. Thank you. OK. Now, uh, before before we open it up, Doug, I, I wanted to say that um, um, citing these trails has been <laughs> Uh, honestly, one of the most complex, certainly the most complex trail project that I've ever been involved with in my career, Aaron Jock from our conservation department, Nate Malloy, uh, former planner Ben Brager, uh, a number of staff members have been involved in this project. But given the ecological sensitivity of the property, wetlands, vernal pools, floodplain, rare species habitat, um, we have worked extensively with the Conservation Commission as well as the Natural Heritage Program to find pathways, and we are we are um, threading the needle, I would say, in trying to figure out how to bring these six foot wide uh, crushed stone paths through this property and still protect uh, rare mussels, rare turtles, um, uh, vernal pools, etc. Um, so. I think uh, Aaron and Nate and, and many others uh, deserve a lot of credit. Um, we're also working very closely with Pure Sky, the uh, solar developer, and they have been very accommodating and uh, to our, our uh, requests of them uh, as we share the site with, with their solar project. So I'm happy to stop there and take questions. All right, well, well then why don't we go to the site uh, visit by board members today? I know at least a couple of people showed up. Um, Chris, uh, or which board members were with you this afternoon? Or Bruce, Bruce your hand Bruce is up. Bruce and Janet were there. Yeah. Okay, Bruce, your your hand is up. Maybe you want to give the overview. Well, I'll I'll, I'll give it briefly. It was um, much more pleasant than Monday. I actually showed up on Monday, and that was a howling blizzard uh, to. Uh, uh, and Joanna has the frosted version, so between us is quite a coverage. But today it was more benign, uh, and uh, we uh, walked uh, about the first quarter or twenty percent, perhaps, of the uh, loop trail down to where that bridge that David mentioned was being. He explained uh, uh, in detail how that was uh, part of the restoration. Project we saw the culvert was there, and you can certainly imagine a considerable difference and a more graceful connection that will happen with this project. So far as that um, uh, water course, the former water course from half a century ago, uh, will benefit and so forth. Um, we saw the existing building. David uh, explains some of the uh, concepts or, or uh, notions for the whole site. Uh, Rick, uh, we noted that he noted that this uh, trail project was, if it was is fitting in with uh, a, a number of other projects for the site. The solar uh, project has been mentioned. What wasn't is that there is the Hickory Ridge Clubhouse that's there. This project is steering clear of that uh, in a way that will allow that uh, project to uh, be a future. Uh, development. It'll be a different type of development because it's on developable land. And as he said, there was about five acres, I think. of Maybe I've got that wrong. Anyway, uh, a certain small fraction of the site is developable and there will be plans for that. And we saw where this project uh, kind of interfaced or uh, uh, side-by-sided with that. Um, there, uh, and we can see as we were 
there there were uh, two or three people uh, were bringing their uh, themselves and their animals so it, it was it, even in this flooded state there were people who were coming down one imagines that this will be a highly valued and highly used uh, based on that a highly valued and highly used project he mentioned the, uh, the 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 value that this will bring to the neighborhoods on either side and there was some discussion about how in the future that uh, those neighborhoods hopefully could be uh, um incentivized to um to to contribute to the maintenance and so forth uh, of the whole enterprise which would be from the town staffing point of view uh, a, a really good thing if it could be uh, reliably made to happen i i that's it from me i uh, that's, it was a it was cold janet i mean janet was there too okay janet you want to add anything Sure, that, those are great summaries. Um, you know, there was questions about whether there'll be garbage at the parking lot for dog waste or human waste. And um, the preference was that there be, you know, carry in, carry out. Um, you know, clearly people with dogs are going to use a site. So um, some, you know, that's one thing. Um, there are questions about maintenance of it because, you know, when I had walked a different part of the site before the meeting, and, um, you know, clearly they've been flooding and on some of the other, you know, like unofficial paths and there were lots of leaves. And I was just thinking, I know the town is really stretched on maintenance. So there was a discussion about that. Um, there were, you know, um, we saw the culverts that were going to be moved and it looked like that would be a lot of restoration of natural streams that were sort of thwarted um, questions about you know, protecting turtles and things like that. And that's all being covered by the natural heritage program to make sure that during construction, turtles are kept out of the construction area and, you know, check to make sure that they are. So that was a um, concern. And, you know, it was just, it's a big, it's a big site. Like, you know, from where we were, we could see the um, fencing to the solar array, but it was off in the distance. Um, it just, you know, and then two people came up to walk their dogs and there were questions like, oh, are there going to be benches? And, you know, we're like, yeah, there's benches because these people wanted places to sit and places to be out of the sun. So it looks like this project has really thought about a lot of these different issues. All right. Thank you, Bruce and Janet. So board members, questions for Dave and team? I guess I'll, I'll no, I don't see any hands yet, so I'll jump in with a couple. Um, I guess the first one is, Dave, you talked about the sort of not the loop trail, but the called the North Trail or whatever, as a sort of path to the uh, town center. Is that really a shorter way to the town center than any other way that they might have? Because it doesn't look like it's very direct. Um, and then the second question I had right off the bat was, what are the plans for the clubhouse and how would the parking area that's reserved for town use be used? Sure, let me address the first question, your first question, Doug. Um, so as far as I know, you know, without this trail, the, clo the, the shortest way to get to the village center would actually be to go on East Hadley Road up to West Street and then come all the way down West Street over a very up and down sidewalk that is in so-so condition, et cetera, et cetera. So by connecting to, and we've had conversations with Mill Valley and the Brook, um, and, and they're very interested in this trail for their residents, for outdoor recreation and enjoyment, exercise, et cetera. In fact, many of those residents are already using the property. Um, this was the most direct route we could make for those residents um, uh, living to the north, given the, as I said, kind of threading the needle between and among all the resource areas. We did honestly hear, and, and I think Chris or um, Jennifer may want to comment, we did go to the DAAC and also the DRB, and we, we got some very instructive feedback from both those groups, there was a lot of discussion at the DAAC um, um, meeting 
about would there be any possibility in the future of putting in a sidewalk on West Pomeroy Lane to connect folks more directly that way, east-west to the property. And I, of, of course, said, you know, the town would be very interested in that in the future, but it's not part of this grant cycle. And um, we've done some quick cost estimates and, and given all the, the, the stream crossings and wetland crossings there and, the, and just the distance, we're probably looking at three quarters of a million to a million dollars to put a sidewalk down to the village center to the new roundabout. So this was our way using existing pathways, using the property itself in the most cost effective way to try to get people north south um, to the village center. It's not, I mean, this is still, this is a good bit of exercise to get down to Mission Cantina or El Comolito or or uh, the, the, the convenience store, but it is a way and it will be, you know, at 5% grade or less, it will be bikeable. It will be, you know, uh, if you have a young child who needs a stroller or uh, something like that, you will be able to take them over the bridges and over the entire trail. So that yeah. was our initial goal. Your second question, Doug, was about the clubhouse. And I think um, Bruce uh, shared a little bit more of the detail that I shared with the group that made it out there today at three. Um, again, we're, we're developing a comprehensive plan for the entire property that we will present to the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, and the, eventually the Town Council. But clearly the clubhouse needs to come down. It was in poor shape when we bought it, uh, bought the property. Uh, the previous owners put very little money into it and it needs to come down. We are trying to pull together a funding plan for that. We estimate the uh, demo cost and removal somewhere between a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars. So it's not a an easy lift for us right now. Um, but that area of the parking lot and the clubhouse, um, as I shared with Bruce and Janet and others, is the really the 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 only and most developable piece of the property, given the frontage, given the upland, given the floodplain rare species habitat that is remaining on the property. Um, the other developable parcel uh, part of the property was developed for solar and it's across the brook. So we do need to look creatively at the parking lot and the, the former clubhouse. In recent months, um, we have, we, the staff and some boards and committees have been talking about this as a potential site for a South Amherst fire station. It clearly has enough acreage to do that and the topography would work, other features, it's on water and sewer. It could also uh, be looked at, and we are looking at it, perhaps for, say, senior affordable housing. It could also be a site for a future senior center or community center. There are a number of different uses, and I think by designing the uh, pathways the way we are, we don't preclude any of those things from happening. Okay. Uh, on the... Uh... On that path and and the connection to the town center, um, have you talked with PVTA about perhaps having a bus stop at the West Street terminus of that path? Um, there is a bus stop um, in the village center, right near, um, right across from the Moan and Dove. So that is a very short walk north to the sewer right-of-way access that we own and the road that we will, part of that road will be made into the connecting trail to uh, Hickory Ridge. So that is the proposed, um, 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 that is the proposed way that we believe people will get there. They'll either come from the village center around the Pomeroy Village Center, walk on the brand new sidewalk up to, up a short walk to the north or they will take the bus down to the village center and again, walk up north or ride their bike or with a family with a stroller and then jump on the trails. And within minutes, you're out in this remarkable property and it, you know, um, you're surrounded by all the natural beauty of the former golf course. Okay. I guess I was just thinking that if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm living in Mill Valley and I don't have a car, um, you know, I may want to shorten my commute as much as I can so that I can 
get to the bus right on as I come out uh, rather than having to go down to the town center. But that can be worked out later if it needs to change. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, I didn't have any questions per se about the project uh, as presented. Uh, the uh, What we didn't go through, but I think probably we have privately, is an extremely comprehensive documentation uh, by Dodson and Flinker, uh, which indicates a, a thoroughly thought out project. And I must admit, I looked at it for half an hour or so, and it was there was I didn't begin to get to the bottom of the of what was there. So I, I, I really think that the, I personally have no particular concerns about the engineering, the design, the, 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 the concept of the trails, where they're going, how they're rooted, um, how they relate to wetlands. Uh, David explained the uh, extraordinary uh, um, concern and, and consideration for protection of wood turtles, which in close, involves enclosing the site are going through with some kind of magic device, which may be just a pair of eyes and, and a lot of experience and getting every bloody wood turtle out of the site and then having a gate that uh, people who are building this project have to close after they go through it so the wood turtles don't inadvertently creep in and find themselves being squished. I mean, it was it just seemed to me that this project is has covered every conceivable base. So... Uh, but there are two things I'd like to explore that really uh, cropped up in the in the site meeting, uh, the site visit, and Janet's mentioned uh, one of them. But uh, I think uh, because I thought that they might be, uh, we might choose to make them subject of conditions. Uh, the first one is uh, we noticed a little green baggie of uh, dog poop there that had been almost strategically placed uh, right at the entrance to the path as though someone was trying to send a message well uh, the message that uh, this project and the town apparently wants to send is carry in carry out and uh, and they uh, and that uh, and david has said that the uh, the, the the town is re reluctant to install trash cans and specifically dog trash waste cans because they are just uh, so disagreeable to have to deal with um uh, that uh, that they would really like to avoid that and to encourage people to behave properly and and bring out what they take in, um, and so therefore it occurred to us that uh, we could assist that uh, in if we decided to um, a, a po apply a condition that basically said that uh, that this uh, that the board's review condition that this pro project be managed. Uh, or that the management plan in, include the stressing of the carry in carry out policy and if we were to do that we would probably help um, uh, give uh, authority to the town's attempts to do that but i wanted uh, to ask first of all to ask david to comment on that uh, and and such that uh, we could consider whether or not uh, some condition of that sort might be appropriate dave I'm, you know, as I stated to Bruce and and um, Janet and others on the site visit, I'm I'm certainly supportive of that. Um, we uh, we do struggle both uh, the Department of Public Works and the Conservation Department and the Recreation Department. All three departments struggle with the um, dual use of our recreation lands, our parks, our commons, and our conservation lands. Uh, dual use um, by by dog walkers and and again it's um it's a it's a very common use it may be one of the highest uh, uh uses of of our lands but uh, the dog waste issue is very real one part of that is that many people do not pick it up and two uh those folks who do pick it up sometimes leave it uh, often leave it along the trail they they hang them from trees um and when we do have receptacles, I believe we have five to seven receptacles around town. It is a very large burden for staff to have to pick up, usually weekly, do that run and dispose of that waste. And those waste receptacles are at places like Mill River Park, Puffers Pond, Amethyst Brook. Um, I know we have some at the dog park, but that's a that's a little bit different facility. But these are at trailheads. So. Um, 
I would very much like this to mimic Conti. Conti, uh, as far as I know, uh, the trail in Hadley does not have any dog waste receptacles. It's carry in, carry out. Dogs must be on a leash at Conti, and I have never seen a dog off leash at the Conti Refuge Trail. Um, I think that would be wonderful. Um, I do think we're going to have to be a little flexible if we find that dog waste becomes a real problem at Hickory as these trails are come into operation. We may we may at some point have to do the receptacles. It's just a reality, but I would I would very much not like to do it. And the same holds true of trash receptacles. If we put out trash waste cans, people will fill them up. They will come at night and fill them up with with household waste. So I really I favor carry in, carry out and people taking personal responsibility for themselves and their dogs. Is there Are there any uh, such places in Amherst where dogs are just not allowed? Is that a precedent? All, all 80 miles of our trails, conservation trails in Amherst are open to dog walking. Uh, our policy is dogs, our policy, the Conservation Commission's policy currently is Dogs must be on leash at all times on conservation land, except they can be off leash at Amethyst Brook and the Lower Mill River area during certain times of the early morning. That's the policy. It's hard to enforce. And uh, there is, I believe, some evidence that dog waste left in the landscape contributes to pollution in the waterways. Um, have we got any sort of public information boards that remind people of that? We, we do. We we okay. have signs all over town. Um, the data is very clear on that. Um, I wish we were more successful. We might need to do more of a public campaign on that, but um, okay. we, we are having water quality issues in the Fort River, in the Mill River, in Buffers Pond, and some of that may be um, some dog waste may contribute to that, but okay. I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this um, unless you all do. Okay. Janet? So this issue is in my wheelhouse um, since I have a dog and um, I walk them on trails in the street and there's definitely a problem with people, you know, like this issue. I wonder though, if we put it in the permit and say, you know, carry in, carry out, if that's just going to tie your hands, because I would rather have the conservation department and just decide a policy and put it on a sign and reform, you know, enforce that um, as one thing, because I, you might want the flexibility of changing later and you don't want to come back and change the condition with us. That seems kind of a time waste. I also wonder if you might, and this is not to be put in a permit, but just have, you know, bags, dog bags there. So, and you know, signage saying carry it out, but, you know, like giving, you know, the providing those. I don't know if you do that at other parks, but I have like, when I first moved to Amherst, Amethyst Brook was just horrendous. And I have a dog and I was just, I started avoiding it because it was so unclean. And we definitely want to keep that out of the Fort River, I think. So I, I think that it might be best to leave it to you, but if it helps you, we could put it as a condition. Dave? I, I tend to agree with Janet. I think, I think it might tie our hands a little too tightly. And I, I just don't, want to have to come back if it's changed. I hear you on the dog uh, bag, waste bag. Um, the feedback we've gotten on that, Janet, is if you put up the bags, then you need to put up the, tr the receptacle for the bags once they've been used. So uh, believe me, I would love to just put out the bags and have people take it in their car. Practically speaking, uh, what people do is they leave it for us on the ground, and we'd rather have it in a container than on the ground or tied to trees or or thrown into the bushes, which happens too. So anyway, I do agree with you. I, I think a condition might be a little too restrictive. Okay. Uh, Johanna. Thank you. My question has to do with flooding and the river jumping its banks, which you know, happens and um, is going to happen more frequently. And I'm just, how how are you thinking about this new infrastructure and preparing it for more frequent and more severe flooding events? Ahead, David. Yeah, that's a great question. And it came up on the site uh, visit, Johanna. Um, and so, first of all, we're 
we're really trying to be minimalists out there in terms of what we put up. Um, I am super conscious of sign pollution. Um, I think I might go a little overboard sometimes. I think we actually need clearer signs. Case in point is uh, a certain parking lot near Stanley Street where we need better signage. But anyway, um, we're taking this approach, which is kind of a minimal, minimalist approach. We're, we're, we're not trying to add too much infrastructure in the floodplain. We realize that some of these trails will overtop, um, particularly the loop trail will um, be overtopped by floodwaters. We're, we're taking a little bit of a cue from Hickory Ridge, which is many of the crushed stone trails for the cart path, uh, for the uh, golf carts that uh, uh, Hickory Ridge put in 60, 65 years ago have been flooded over many, many times and they're still there. So these will be at grade, they will be um, constructed um, you know, uh, per the Dodson, uh, per the Dodson design, in a really solid way, there will be very, very little, you know, relief for anything to catch on. I think to Janet's point earlier, the key will be removing material that ends up on them. But uh, the the conservation department just recently acquired a skid steer uh, with a, um, a a front end loader, if you will. Uh, or a, um, a bucket, I should say, that um, is six feet wide and can maintain these trails and many other ADA trails in Amherst. So we're trying to do it in a minimalist way. We're not trying to add too much um, infrastructure. We believe the bridges will be fine even if they're overtopped by floodwaters. Um, and that's why we didn't go in we didn't go with the Conti refuge model, which was doing, pressure treated lumber raised up, this this area floods more than the Conti Refuge area. So we just wanted to avoid that because of the damage and the cost of rebuilding. I hope that answers the question. It does, thank you. Dave, uh, since you mentioned the existing trails that were for the golf carts, um, are you eradicating all the other trails on the property or? You know, what's, what's the vision for how really natural this will ever look? That's a really great question, Doug. So part of what I've said uh, twice, I think, is, is, uh, is threading the needle here. In order to get these trails, uh, the Loop Trail and the North-South Trail, to be approved by the Natural Heritage uh, Program at the state level, Aaron Jock did a masterful job of... Um, uh, mitigating and compensating. So we are retiring a number of the old cart paths that Hickory Ridge Golf Course maintained for 65 years. And we are basically letting nature take its course and rewilding those trails that we don't think um, are either needed anymore or perhaps go in areas that are too sensitive. We've had feedback from, for instance, the turtle biologists and they've said, hey, some of those card paths that were part of the golf operation take people into areas where the turtles really like to do their thing. And so we've eliminated those and that has allowed us to make it through the permitting process with the Natural Heritage Program. Having said that, what you see on the uh, in your packet for the North-South Trail and the Loop Trail and the connection between them, those are the core trails that we're proposing. And those are the improved trails. We didn't um, we didn't uh, overlay that with what we're calling the single track trails. In other words, there will be other trails on the property. For instance, we heard loud and clear when we acquired the property, please make some really long, straight, nice, um, uh, aesthetically pleasing cross country ski trails. So we heard that. And the westernmost part of the property is very conducive to that. So we have what we call a single track. And, and this, is, this is nothing more than a mowed path. There's no infrastructure. There's no crushed stone. There'll, there'll likely be no immediately, no benches. So there are going to be other trails, not a lot of them. But for instance, one will go all the way around the western array and give you views of the Mount Holyoke Range and uh, the farmland to the west in Hadley. So yes, there will be other trails. 
but these will be the only ones that will be improved. And we are actually retiring um, many linear feet, hundreds of linear feet of the old cart paths. We're even going to retire one of the bridges over the Fort River, which we really don't need five bridges over the Fort River. And that's a very high cost of maintenance long-term for the taxpayers of Amherst. So we may even retire a second bridge over the Fort River. So we may have gained some trails, but we're eliminating many linear feet of other trails. Okay. Board members, other questions? All right. But Doug, could I just share one other thing in terms sure of does. timeline? Timeline, just to give the board a, a a sense of timeline. These two grants are really knocking on our door here. We are hoping to bid this project out in January, both these trail systems, and have this work completed by the end of June 24. Not to say the trails would all open by then in their finished form, but at least to meet the grant deadlines. If we have other um, major components, obviously we would need to come back to the planning board and other boards and committees. For instance, lots of other ideas have been talked about at Hickory Ridge, um, an amphitheater, anything to do with the clubhouse and the parking, any reuse of that area would obviously come back through the planning board. And as I said, we will be presenting a comprehensive plan which outlines some of the options for the frontage. And then, um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. So these elements we think are reasonable and achievable, but there's many, I think a couple of years of other projects that we will propose for Hickory Ridge. Okay, thank you. Janet? So I this was this issue was raised in the development application report and um, in my mind in this today, which is about maintenance. And so, you know, we have a huge trail system in Amherst, which I love, and I know that there's not enough staff to keep trails open and cut during the growing season or maintaining, um, you know, wood bridges. I mean, even just planks. And I can point to many examples where I live. Um, and my concern was, you know, we're building this beautiful trail system. Can we maintain it? Um, do we have the staffing to do it when we're not maintaining our current trails? And it's not a criticism of anybody. It's just that we don't have enough staff. And so, um, Dave did bring up the idea of having a volunteer core in the neighborhood. And I, I think you could get people from different parts of Amherst to join that. And I like that idea, but I, I do think that's a really serious issue. It's like, we might build this beautiful pass, but will they be maintained and cleared? And if they are maintained and cleared, is that at the expense of other trails? So I just, I didn't know how to fix that. We could say, maintain your trails in a good condition in our permit. But I just, I think that's a big issue. And I don't think you can solve it without some more hiring. Yeah, I, I had kind of the same thing going through my head because of my involvement in this cycle for CPAC. Um, you know, Dave, you guys put in a request for significant money for trail maintenance. Uh, not, not at this location, as far as I know, but, uh, you know, I mean, how, how long are we going to keep building things and some other things fall apart? So what are your thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, um, we really aren't, with the exception of Hickory Ridge, we're really not expanding our trail system um, much at all. So I, I do acknowledge Janet's concerns, and they're my concerns, the town's concerns about how do we maintain what we have. But a couple of things. Um, so I think, first of all, the trend in the last seven to 10 years has been, we've really been trending toward not acquiring more land. Hickory Ridge is certainly a signature project, a very special piece of property, but um, I have not proposed a new acquisition other than Hickory Ridge, I think in the last four years, maybe five years. Um, but um, so we're not expanding trail system except for Hickory Ridge. We're also trying to get more creative. I mentioned to Janet and Bruce and others out there in the field that um, we do have a very active uh, group of abutters who live in Orchard Valley who are interested in volunteering to help maintain these trails. 
these trails are actually, in some regard, easier to maintain than a forested trail with root systems and, and complex wetlands crossings. I mean, these are fairly straightforward bridges that might be 10 feet long. So yes, they eventually will be, be need to be uh, replaced, but I, I presume these bridges will last between 10 and 20 years and the decking is the only thing that needs to be replaced. As I said, I think a six foot wide crushed stone flat 5% or less trail is actually relatively easy to maintain versus say, um, I don't know, the KC trail that spans much of the length of Amherst or the Robert Frost trail that's, you know, goes up on the Mount Holyoke range and ends up all the way up in Wendell. So those are challenging, much more challenging trails to maintain. The other thing I wanted to say is that we are partnering much more these days with the Kestrel Trust. And the Kestrel Trust does have a very robust um, staffing plan and, and staffing thanks in large part to Kristen DeBoer. So they are much more interested, willing and able to help us. And they're helping us on the uh, Robert Frost Trail. And they just helped us uh, do a, a raised boardwalk at, um, uh, down off of South, uh, down off of Bay Road um, to thwart a beaver issue down there. So I think we're going to be turning to the Kestrel Trust more and more to help us. We do have two full-time staff, and I don't anticipate us getting any more staff in the field. But I think it's a real, it'll be a real challenge. But I guess my point is we need to spend more money on maintenance and not acquire um, more acreage to maintain. Okay. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. You can unmute. So I didn't want to dissuade you from acquiring more trails or land. Um, so, you know, and I, I live near part of the KC trail and you have clipped my way down the trail and my husband has lifted limbs. And one time he went down with his weed whacker because everything was getting really grassy near the wetland and ran into a neighbor who was actually doing that. And so and then I know some other neighbors are also cutting things back. So I wonder in a way if maybe that's a solution to the problem where, you know, if, if the conservation, if you're, if your guys are coming in to do my section of the trail, if you called me or my, you know, interested neighbor and they can say, Hey, they're coming in, we could all work together or something like that. So, you know, there's, that would be more fun than feeling bitter. You know? <laughs> and like, I'm the only person that's cutting when it's actually not true. So I wonder if that kind of, could could get kind of organically grow a little bit, you know, because, you know, I and I've talked to other friends who live in different parts of Amherst. And I'm like, yeah, I would do that. You know, people have said I would do that if there's, and I don't want to put another burden on staff, but there might be a way of having little precinct captains and stuff like that who call around. No, absolutely, and we're, we've been working on trying to get that structure in place a little bit. And, and there are some neighborhoods that actually already maintain their section of trail, working with Brad Border Week or um, our assistant land manager. So absolutely, Janet, I think we're open to that and we have to be more open to it in the future um, because we, we, we're we not gonna get it. I don't think we're gonna get any more personnel. We still will be going to CPAC and seeking grants to pay for the materials to build bridges, rebuild bridges, um, do ADA improvements, things like that. Um, but we're not we're not out there expanding the trail system. In fact, I'm I'm, scratching my head saying, what trail have we added in my time as director of conservation other than these? I've been really kind of bully on not doing any more trails. Pete Westover created 80 miles of trails and I know how much maintenance they take. So I've not been anxious to add to the trail system myself. Okay. Uh, Dave, uh, just a went through my head. Uh, does the town have liability concerns if you have volunteers out there next to staff? Yes, we yes we do. We do have we also we do ask volunteers to sign, of course, you know, standard waivers and things of that sort, but we as I said, um there's a number of neighborhoods that we've organized um volunteer efforts and then we've also had many many at places like Puffer's Pond, Mount uh, Mount Pollux as well as um, oh, uh, Orchard Valley uh, taking care of the, the pond and conservation area uh, on, off of Pond View. Okay. So, yep. All right. Um, 
Let's see, not seeing any more hands from board members. I guess I will ask the public. Uh, this is the time if you would like to make some comments on these proposed trails uh, at Hickory Ridge. Uh, so far, I see one hand from Claire Bertrand. Could we bring her over, Pam, and mm -hmm. give her uh, a timer to keep track of her comment period? Mm -hmm. Welcome, Claire. Hi, thank you. Thanks for this presentation. Um, I'm, um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I'm curious if you could speak more to what ecological restoration means. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm mowing. So I, I think I, what I've heard and I would like it clarified is that this these trails that we're discussing are six feet wide, fully accessible, but there may be other trails that will continue to be used or, so I, if you could talk more about other smaller walking trails. So those are my two questions, thanks. Okay, Dave, you are muted. So let me see if I get those clear. So um, uh, ecological restoration, um, let me talk a bit about that. So when we first acquired the property, we knew uh, and, and, and full well that we would need to do a comprehensive plan for the entire property, given all the competing interests and, and desires and all the excitement that the acquisition generated. So we we set out to gather information. We had a number of meetings out there. We also had an engage page on the town website where we got hundreds and hundreds of different comments. That uh, led us to begin to gather um, um, zoning data. Uh, we surveyed the entire property. We also mapped uh, all of the wetlands, vernal pools, floodplain, um, 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 estimated and priority habitat for rare species. We got in touch with the state and brought in their biologists. They have looked at uh, mussels in the river. They've looked for rare plants, as we've talked about turtles, et cetera, et cetera. So that has all been kind of fed into a plan. Um, we hired a consulting company to come in and help us, and we worked alongside them to create as I said, a comprehensive, well, I shouldn't say comprehensive, an ecological restoration plan. And what that does is it basically says, um, it gives us ideas about how to manage the property uh, in the future. What do we want to see in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years along the riparian corridor? What do we want to see the wetlands do? You know, uh, this was a manicured landscape for 65 years that is not our intent moving forward. We want to do a couple of things. We want to control invasive species because multiflora rose and Japanese knotweed and, and many others will take over. We also want to encourage certain, um, certain types of habitat to thrive on the property. So um, much of the stream bank, as an example, much of the stream bank was channelized and hardened and um, think of riprap. You're all familiar with riprap when we basically keep the river in its channel and we harden the banks of the river. So this ecological restoration plan looks at all of that and says, how can we, for instance, add woody material to the river to uh, diversify the ecosystem in the, in the river? Things like that, Claire. It also speaks to what parts of the property will be mown to keep it in early successional habitat where we might encourage grassland birds and other pollinators to thrive. So certain parts of the property will be mowed to your question about mowing, certain parts of the property in the future will be mowed periodically to keep it in early successional habitat. But along the river, we'll encourage a, a full canopy to shade the river, uh, the Fort River and its and the Plum Brook. Um, smaller trails will be 
um, developed in the future. And those trails, as I said, will simply be a mode path. Um, if you think about the path up to the top of Mount Pollux, if you've been to Mount Pollux, it's simply, you know, mowed three times a year and there's no improvement and it's grass and we keep it mowed. So we keep down poison ivy and ticks. And so there will be trails around the edges of the property that are in that, uh, that kind of trail. Low maintenance, cross country skiing, running, hiking, but they won't be fully ADA. The only fully ADA trails will be the loop and the north-south uh, trail you see on your maps. I hope that answers those questions. Claire, are you all set? Answers my questions, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person that got their hand up was Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Again, speaking as a resident of Cottage Street. A um, couple questions. Uh, I heard mention of the master plan and other elements such as amphitheater and the many requests that came in uh, from Engage Amherst. Is there any opportunity to see these trails in particular as part of that master plan? No one has no one has yet seen the master plan. Um, is it imminent? And is there an opportunity for the community to see what alternatives are being proposed as part of a master plan? Uh, second item is access to East Hadley Road. Uh, it's the north-south trail. Looks like it comes far to the sort of to the east of all of the apartment complexes that that front um, East Hadley Road. Is there any opportunity to create a connection further to the south? I'll just say southwest of the, the trail that you're showing now. It seems like folks would really have to make an effort um, from, the, from the, the heart of that apartment complex to make their way out and around in order to get onto the trail. Uh, and that may be some access may be precluded by the um, by the solar fields, but perhaps uh, there are roads that could be fenced off and allow access through that area to a more direct connection. And then thirdly, um, as a former uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee and a landscape architect, um, I really appreciated the details that were provided to you all uh, regarding construction of the bridges. And I noticed that the use of helical piles is proposed. Um, I am a strong advocate of helical piles because it allows construction starting on, from one bank and building, essentially building the bridge um, as you go with the piles. So I was delighted to see that detail. I think it's a very strong uh, approach to protecting um, the wetlands and minimizing impact. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Dave, you want to take those two questions? Sure. Um, yeah, in reverse order, just acknowledging the the, the helical pier, heel, uh, piles. Um, yes, um, we're, we're very proud of that element. Um, it is a very small wetland, but we're trying to do the very best we can to protect that wetland on the western side. Um, uh, so in terms of the comprehensive plan, we are we are pulling together those elements of that plan. And yes, I would say it is, I'm not sure I'm going to use the word imminent, but certainly in the next few months, we will present that to the various town boards and committees. Um, we had this opportunity to move forward with the these core elements of the trail system before that plan was ready. We felt pretty confident that one, we would not preclude future um, development ideas on the frontage by doing these trails and that um, we would lose these grant opportunities if we didn't move forward. So absolutely, we are coming forward with a com what I call a comprehensive plan for the property. Um, the north-south trail extension, if I understood the question correctly, 
is there a way to connect further to the west on in the northwest? The short answer is yes. Um, the more the more complete answer is um, we are having conversations with the um, owners of the apartment complexes and condos to the north. Those have been kind of ongoing off and on for the last year, year and a half. Um, we certainly would love to make a connection more to the north uh, west. Um, I will say that those apartment complexes and owners, um, their biggest concern is liability. So if you build it, who will come and is it just the residents of um, one apartment complex or the residents of many? Um, and as you may know, if you're familiar with the GIS map of that part of town, it's Mill Valley Apartments that um, really has the, the bulk of our northern border of our property at Hickory Ridge. So, so the answer is yes, we are working on a trail connection to the northwest. We still believe where we currently have it is the, the fastest and easiest way to make a connection all the way out to um, all the way out to uh, East Hadley Road. And so that's kind of our first goal. So in theory, if you just to, to play this out, if you live in Orchard Valley and you wanted to up over West Pomeroy Lane with your family or friends or or by yourself, jump on, you know, one of these trails, you could walk safely all the way to up to East Adley Road, jump on the new ex, uh, expanded uh, sidewalk, multi-purpose trail, uh, multi-purpose sidewalk there and walk all the way over to Guelph Park and back on this trail and, and vice versa. So, that's our goal with that North-South Trail. I do hear you, Pam. We would like to make a more direct connection to the West, Northwest, and we're, we're kind of working on that. It will not be fully accessible. There is no way for us to achieve an accessible trail because of the topography in that area. All right. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, David. Uh, next public comment from Karen Sanchez Epler. Welcome, Karen. If you could give us your name uh, and your address. And Karen Sanchez. Three minutes. Yes, Karen Sanchez Epler. My husband, Benigno Sanchez Epler, is here too. 22 Cayman's Circle. Um, so, a, a butters and much um, people who have much loved walking in this rewilding landscape. Um, saw on the map how close the um, connector trail is to the um, solar farm and just wondering what, how, how, I guess, how you're seeing the solar farm being um, incorporated into the conservation and recreational aspects of, um, of Hickory Ridge and and I guess, too, who's responsible for that, how much um, the solar farm people are responsible for what that border looks like, how much um, the town is taking charge of that. So that, that's one question. Who pays for the, for the green barrier between the fence and the trail, if there's any? Uh, the other question that we have is, uh, what is the town thinking about the relationship between the Garris Trail on the other side of the Ford River and the connector. Uh, these are companion trails. Um, Garris Trail has a discontinuity problem over at the, when you get to the bridge, um, uh, but it would be quite an amazing loop, uh, Garris Trail and the, and the connector. And uh, that's, uh, I wonder what, I wonder whether there's any planning uh, for, for, for that. All right, thank you, Dave. Yeah, let me come back to the Garris Trail. Um, that's a really great question, too. Um, I'll try to address the first question. I may need a little redirect. Happy to take that if uh, from the from the, the person who asked the question. Um, the interface between the trail and the solar. Um, this is quite a challenge, and, and we've given this quite a bit of thought. Um, you know, there's certainly 
those people who are challenged by the fact that there will be 26 acres of solar on this beautiful property. The I will start by saying, as I did earlier in the in the meeting, um, we bought the property knowing mm -hmm. full well that there would be 26 acres of solar. Um, that changes the the property. It changes the landscape. However, there are a number of positives that come from that. Number one, um, you know, we signed a 20 year lease with Pure Sky for that uh, 26 acres of solar. Springfield will be the off taker of that um, green power not the town of Amherst. Um, we frankly did not, at the time we signed the deal, did not have the um, demand for that. And I don't think we still do. This, this would be, I think about a 6.1 or 6.2 megawatt array. So in part of this project, we are helping uh, Springfield to achieve their, um, their carbon uh, goals. So I think it's a wonderful thing because um, um, uh, Springfield did not have uh, the opportunity at the time that this deal was struck. Number two, we will also get a pilot payment, a payment in lieu of taxes that will be about three times as much as Hickory Ridge was paying when it was a golf course. So it will be on the order of $80,000, $85,000 in the first year. And that will help pay for other municipal um, uh, expenses, firefighters, police officers, planners, and, and the list goes on. In terms of how the array will interface with the trail, I think it's a great opportunity for us through the interpretive sign system to really talk about what that array is doing. It really, if you've all been next to solar arrays, um, they're, they're quite, in general, benign. They, they are there, they are relatively quiet. Yes, there will be some battery storage on this, but the battery storage will not be near that north-south trail for the most part. But it's an opportunity for us to interpret what that array is doing, the green power that it is generating 365 days a year. So we see that as, as a real plus. I will say when you look at the map, we really had to put the trail as close to the array fencing as we could because the Natural Heritage Program wanted us to stay out of great turtle habitat and away from the Fort River. So that's what we did. You might say, well, why? Why couldn't the trail be closer to the river? Well, with the trail, with trails come impacts like people, dogs, children, um, um, cute turtles, believe it or not, they go missing from natural habitats quite a bit. So we don't want wood turtles and box turtles and and snapping turtles and other turtles to be you know, impacted in the least possible way. So that's why the trail is as close to the array um, in the central array as possible. But I think it's a great opportunity for people to learn about solar power. We all need power and we're gonna do some interpretive signage with Pure Sky to educate on that. I will say that once the arrays are built, there's very little maintenance to them. Pure Sky will be out there once a month with a pickup truck. There's really very little maintenance. So there won't be a lot of trucks or activity around the arrays. There'll be much, many more people walking the trails, I think. In terms of the Garrett Trail, I'm really glad you asked that. That's a wonderful question. It is part of our comprehensive plan for that area. The Garris Trail is off of uh, uh, West Street, right across from uh, Crocker Farm School. And it's a little bit of a trail to nowhere um, it, it's wonderful. It's right along the uh, Fort River on the east side, but there's, it's a dead end trail. And our hope is to one day, there are a couple of old bridge abutments along the Fort River. And our hope is to connect it via a bridge using one of those old uh, bridge abutments to this new trail on the west side of the Fort River. But again, that's another day and another project. And we don't have the funding for it right now, but that would be the hope some, somewhere down the road. Thank you. Yes, and was that wasn't an anti-solar power question for me. It was just oh, no, seeing how very close it was and wondering what you were thinking about it. So thank yeah. you so much. No, I, and by the way, I did not interpret it that way in any way, shape or form, but we've thought about that a lot. You're gonna be very close to about an eight foot fence and you know, people, it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing, but I think it's that appreciation for what those panels will be doing. Um, and they'll be trackers as well. So they're gonna be following the sun. So that'll be kind of cool to watch out there. 
when the, when they're tracking the sun and and uh, generating power for all of us. All right. Thank you to Karen and your and your husband. Thank you, David. The next uh, and I think the last public comment uh, is coming from Marilyn Billings. If we could bring her over. Marilyn, please. Where did she go? Did we lose her? There she is. Where, where, where? Um, ah, okay. Yeah, let's bring over Marilyn. Please give us your name and your street address in Amherst. Excellent. Thank you very much. Marilyn Billings from um, uh, East Hadley Road uh, in the brook, actually. Uh, I live down in the, uh, let's see, the furthest, the closest probably to this project from from the brook and I've been really interested in this project all, all along. So appreciate your comprehensive, really uh, detailed uh, assessment today, David, that was really wonderful. I'm interested in a couple of different things. One being from the brook area, we're more on the Northeast part. And I'm thinking that the trail that you have coming from the North is probably coming down along that, that roadway that is already used by uh, public works for the sewer system, not sure. So I wanted to ask that question. Um, and noticed that recently there was a cement barrier put up right almost outside my door that may be part of this. I wasn't really sure. Um, but just um, wanting to acknowledge that a lot of people come down that uh, dirt road and come into the northeast part of the Hickory Ridge area and go out walking through there and there's a path that's not mowed that's not maintained at all that I actually go out on a lot and I picked up some um, gum wrappers today when I was out there um, just to talk about the trash a bit but I'm hoping that's that's one of the areas that does get at least mown three times a year because it gets heavy use even from the people across the way and on Columbus Street I think that's the name of it Columbia Columbus um, that, that come in there and um, walk their dogs and do all those kind of things. So I guess the question about what, you know, where is that the place where you're looking for the Northern um, piece to connect onto that connector trail uh, is, is a good, a good question to start with. And also just to say that being out there today, given, yes, there was a lot of rain that came down, but it's the most flooded I have ever seen that part of the Northeastern part of the, the uh, area, and I don't know if it's because of the fencing that the solar power has put up there or, or what the situation is, but it's un it's unusual. All right. So Dave. thank you. Um, thank you very much, Marilyn, for those comments and questions. I'll do the best I can to to, to address them. One is just on the flooding. Um, I don't think the, the solar fences have anything to do with the flooding. I think this is we are living in a time of, in a different time yeah. yeah a different time of unpredictable weather and the weather patterns are changing and you know we just in the last week and a half got probably Delicious. six plus inches of rain so yes we will see that um great questions i'm so glad you're you're on the call here and on in the public hearing um we still have some work to do i, I referenced working with mill valley and uh the property owners in the brook we had some very productive uh, conversations in 21 and 22 with the um, association in the brook. Mm -hmm. I think there is general um, support for the project. Um, we do, the town does have a sewer easement, a sewer maintenance yes. easement over that property. And, um, you know, we have worked with the leadership at the, um, the association in the brook. Um, and I believe there's general agreement there to grant another easement, an additional easement. So that's the direction we would take on the northeastern portion of of the Brooks property, connecting us all to uh, connecting the trail system to East Hadley Road. Um, I don't I don't know anything about the cement barrier. I will look into that. It has nothing to do with this project, but I'm now you got me curious, so I will take a look in there and see what that's all about. It might be something the DPW put in there. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so I appreciate all your comments. It is it is an existing trail already, but it is unimproved at this point. It's simply a path through the 
through the uh, the the vegetation. So mm -hmm. we would we would be it would be six feet wide, uh, five percent or less grade, and have benches along the way and interpretive signage in various locations. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. All right. So that was our last public comment hand. Um, I see the time is 8.02. Uh, Janet, I see your hand up. Why don't you make uh, your comment or ask your question and then we'll go to a break. Well, you know, I, I have a question based on what Ms. Billing said. You know, I've seen Hickory Ridge much, much more flooded than it was today, um, at least on the um, Pomeroy section. And I was wondering about the solar array. Did they, has their stormwater system gone in? Um, and I was wondering if the excess water was, if they haven't put that in yet, is that because they've cut the trees down and the land is not holding the water the way it normally did? So has that stormwater management been installed into that array? Because I think we shouldn't be seeing that flooding or I'm wondering why, if it's okay. just. Um, so first of all, um, Really, virtually not. Yes, um, you know some of the trees have been cut in the solar array locations, um, but I am completely confident that has nothing to do with the the uh, level of the Fort River in this current flood uh, period we're in. Um, any number of things, you know, the Connecticut River as is at you know record highs for this time of year. The the, the Fort River actually surcharges. I don't know if you're familiar with surcharging, but essentially the Fort River is backed up all the way through Hadley into Amherst when the Connecticut River rises. So water can't get into the Connecticut River. It's like being in a traffic jam at a at a sporting event or even a even a roundabout with lots of traffic. Think about the Connecticut River as the roundabout rivers coming into tributaries of the Connecticut can't get in. It slows all the water down and then it backs it up. So I'm quite confident that the, the Pure Skies project has nothing to do with the water levels in the fort at this point. The other thing is that we have a number of beaver dams in the Fort River and those beaver dams just naturally are holding back a whole boatload of water. Now, when this was a golf course, I will say, um, Often, uh, the Hickory Ridge folks would breach those dams and discourage, I would use in quotes, discourage beavers from spending a lot of time on the golf course. Um, we have not done that much of that. So there may be beaver dams, there may be multiple beaver dams in this stretch that are holding back water. Um, the other thing is that um, Maryland has a very unique perspective because she lives north east of the property, we can't see that section from the road. The really the only section you can see from the road is really down near the loop or down near uh, the clubhouse. So um, I think she has a very unique perspective on, you know, seeing that flooding up there in the north, uh, the northeast corner. But it, it's simply we got a ton of rain and the water can't move quickly into the Connecticut River. But I, it, I'm confident it has nothing to do with what your sky has done very little work out there, frankly, because of delays in construction schedules. So I'm, I'm sorry. So just to clarify, the stormwater management system is in there or not yet? It is not because the oh, okay. Okay. yeah, it is not because they they haven't done any construction. The only the only work they've done is to come in and put crushed gravel on the road and uh, cut down the trees that were allowed in the permit. Uh, okay. And then they've done a little work on the bridges and a couple of stream crossings. But other than that, no. Yeah. And all okay. the native vegetation, except for the trees, is all still there. The entire, both array areas are completely vegetated. Other than the trees, all the other vegetation hasn't been touched. All right. Uh, Dave, if I could uh, ask you one quick question. How does Pure Sky access the solar array? Are they using the black existing shared access road in sort of the southeast corner? Maybe if Nate or Pam could put that image back up, people would want to see this because I think it is important. Let's see. Hmm. 
Yeah, and I guess it's the, the root that has the number five on it is what I was wondering about. Correct. So the only access and the, cent the central access for the uh, construction of the arrays and the maintenance of the arrays will be, and I'm sure somebody's cursor is going to find West Pomeroy Lane there in the lower right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, lower right, keep right there, Pam. Oh, you went by it. <laughs> All right, keep going. Right there. Right there. You. there that road. So Pure Sky has improved that road. They will improve that bridge number five uh, with the number five will be improved for both the uh, construction vehicles and maintenance vehicles. And then we will use that bridge at a, as a pedestrian bridge uh, for the trail. And that will be the uh, access to the arrays. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nate, I see your hand. Sure. Thanks. I was just going to say kudos to Pam. She was the one who was following Dave during the presentation. It wasn't me. Thank so um, if you saw funny smiles, it was because uh, Pam was doing, <laughs> doing, doing the driving. You, Pam. And... <laughs> thank you, Pam. I thought it was Nate, but thank you. That's okay. She beat me to it and she was doing a good job. So. I will give Nate all the credit for my error. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, so the time now is 8.08, .08, and I, I'm going to propose we take a five-minute break and come back at 8.13. And um, we'll continue the conversation, hopefully go through findings and conditions and talk about what uh, how we want to proceed. So turn off your camera, mute yourself, and when you return, to, at least turn on your camera so we know you're back. Thank you.
Pam, I just wanted to let you know that I think I accidentally either left the meeting or got booted, but I am back now. It's Johanna. Oh, do you know when you uh, left? Um, It was during the break and then oh. I joined at 8.14. Oh, okay. So we haven't, we haven't began again yet. So I you're, see. you're perfect, but thank you for letting me know. I hope I didn't give you the boot. That was not my intention. Pam, I'm also Hi Karen. You... Yes, yeah, we can hear you, Karen. I my um internet is pretty iffy here. I'm in Hawaii. Okay. But, so I've been listening, but the picture was gone for a while. Okay. All gone for a while. And now it's back. Hopefully. Been, now you're back. Okay. Sounds I, good. I, we were admiring you because we thought you were in Europe. <laughs> so I was like, wow, she's up really late. <laughs> No, oh, it's actually, it's much earlier. I'm wide awake. Good. <laughs> okay. Better than the rest of us. Yeah. So I have 816. And hopefully everybody's hiding behind their dark screen at the moment. There's Fred. Nope, that's just Jesse. I'm here, but I'm eating a cookie, and I don't think people want to watch me eat a cookie. Okay. <laughs> Fred, are you back? Seems like we lost most of our public uh, attendees, although there's still three remaining. Mm -hmm. Hello, Fred. Um, are we allowed to proceed without Fred having evidence that he's back or should we, how long should we give him? I think you can proceed without him and just catch him up when he arrives. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I guess I, I have 817. And do board members have additional questions for Dave and his team? Actually, it looks like Nate's still here, but we lost Jennifer. So 
So I'm not seeing any hands. So at this point, Chris, would it make sense for us to go to your uh, development application report or to the possible uh, conditions and findings? We can go to the development application report. I don't think there are many things that are left unresolved, mm -hmm. but I will say that one of the things I didn't catch on my first go round was that um, that structures within the FPC need um, special permits from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that was something I caught today spoke to Rob Mora about that and um, sent you all an email about that and some and an additional um, revision to conditions. Yes. But yes. if you wanted to go through the um, development application report, we could start on page two. Okay, Pam, why don't you scroll up? Note that I had only known about one shade structure but there are actually two st shade structures in phase two, so in phase one. So I wanted to mention that. And um, same is true in the general section down at the bottom of that page, that there are two shade structures. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't think I made any changes. Oh, except for the very last page and also there's a reference to one shade structure but i would suggest that should be changed to two but there other than that there weren't too many issues um the uh on page three we talked about a landscape plan and they really didn't submit a landscape plan there will be new landscaping in the form of the plants needed to stabilize the slopes or restore wetland areas and we asked a question about maintenance, and I think uh, Janet already asked that question. Yeah. And we received an answer about that. There's no lighting. Um, they are proposing signs, three different types of signs, a typical signpost sign, a kiosk sign, and a proposed parking area sign. So, um, and we, we did have questions about that, which arose later. Um, we realized that some of those signs were oversized and that um, they were taller than is allowed in the zoning district in which they're located. So when we get to the conditions, we can talk about um, there were waivers and conditions listed on that sheet that I sent you. And we can talk about that. Just as a note, Fred has arrived. Thank you. Okay. okay. Keep going, Chris. Or maybe you were finished. I don't know. Okay, um, parking and bicycle racks. Um, there are bicycle racks proposed. The DRB propo uh, suggested that you might want to consider a different type of bicycle rack, but I don't think the um, applicant has proposed anything different. So maybe you want to live with the bicycle racks that were proposed by the applicant. Um, well, we could, we could ask Dave, uh, what did you guys think about using a different type of bicycle rack? Um, as opposed to the loops, Chris. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're we're. I think we're very open to that. I think the planning staff had talked about that. I think the loops can be, frankly, kind of limiting, and the the likelihood that, you know, it's one thing to put in loops at a kind of um, distant uh, parking lot on Bay Road for a conservation trail, but I think the the likelihood that we're going to get you know, lots of people interested in coming here, walking, biking, hiking, uh, running, uh, driving is greater. So I, I think more more bike racks is better. So I think the loops, anything we can do that is better than the loops would be good and we're open to that. Yeah, I guess my recollection is that they were recommending a sort of larger consolidated structure that accommodated a whole bunch of bikes as one unit as opposed to multiple individual loops. I think they thought it might be aesthetically better. I think it's likely to be more compact also. Yes. So you could make a condition about um, 
asking to them to, uh, asking the applicant to come back with a different bike loop arrangement yeah Could we ask him to come back with a different sign later so we can move this along? A different sign? You you said the signs were non like there was some problem with the signs? They yeah, said I think we should talk about that when we get to the waivers, and then we can um, be more definitive about what's okay. going on with the signs. Um, right. <clears throat> let's see. The number of parking spaces, I think 27 is shown on the plan. 20 was listed in the management plan. So I think that the planning board should consider that 27 is the actual number. Um, and I don't think you have to have a condition about that unless you want to. That was just a question that I had. And that was about 27 what? Parking oh, spaces. Parking spaces, yeah. Oh. Um, and the number of parking spaces is based on this rather vague requirement. Um, you know, for all other permitted uses, and they list a bunch of different uses um, that you that the applicant should provide adequate parking spaces to accommodate um, occupants, employees, members, customers, clients. So we have to just kind of take a um, a best guess at how many people would be here at any particular time, and um, the estimate is, you know, that there are going to be twenty seven people coming here, and then I think there are an additional um, three. Um, Three, three ADA spaces, so it's all really 30 spaces altogether. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that a sort of function of the fact that the existing parking lot has, you know, more than more spaces than that, and that mm -hmm. we're really just leaving an existing, you know, those existing spaces so that, and, and the rest of the lot is being taken offline. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, I see Bruce and Johanna. Bruce, um, I've been to the Moody, uh, the Conti Trail uh, in Hadley a few times, and my recollection is that there are actually fewer, and possibly far fewer than twenty-seven parking spaces down there. And I typically haven't been there when it's been full, but maybe I just haven't gone at the right time. So I suppose uh, we we could be guided by that, and uh, and so in in so far as we are, twenty seven would seem to be a uh, a good number. If Kant is not a good guide, well then someone will say so. Um, and secondly, the uh, as you say, the, the we're taking they're taking proposing a certain section of an existing parking area will be uh, upgraded, patched, and so forth. I mean, minimally upgraded, as I understood it from the conversation today. Uh, and my, 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 my guess is, or my, my figuring is that uh, if this turns out to be significantly insufficient, uh, we will find out, and uh, we would have the trouble, the opportunity to redress that uh, in considering uh, the development of the 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 developable part the the fully developable developable part of the uh, parcel. Yeah. Well, we. I mean, we also, I guess, have the option of simply saying that a smaller number of spaces are required. And you know, if there, if the, if it turns out it is really not enough demand for twenty seven spaces, and if at some point the town decides to you know, repave the lot and take out half of the spaces, then they'd have that flexibility. So I guess we could go that way too. Johanna. I think there are only two ADA spaces, but now. maybe I'm remembering wrong. Yeah, but I think there are only two now. Um, Dave, Dave is nodding his head yes, I guess, in agreement. And then... Yeah, I think I am. I'd be curious to hear Dave's thoughts on reducing the kind of required number of parking spaces. Twenty-seven does seem generous. I mean, I feel like I often go to Amethyst Brook at peak times, and there might, you know, there's parking there for maybe fifteen cars. So this would almost be double that. I might my math might be wrong. Maybe Dave knows some of the numbers for what are what is the parking capacity at other conservation areas and. Are they anticipating more traffic here? And, you know. Dave? 
Uh, these are all great questions. So I think, I mean, when when the trails are built out, I do anticipate these being very popular. So kind of taking in, you know, my my similar recollection to Conti and also Johanna's uh, reference to um, Sweet Alice parking off of Bay Road, I believe that is 15 plus one or two ADA designated spaces at the Sweet Alice. So I think 25 to 27 is, is a good place to start. To Doug's comment, I mean, we're really controlling the size of this parking, at least for the short term, with Jersey barriers. So, you know, I, I would not want to move those willy nilly, but, and I presume if we increase the parking there, we would have to come back to the planning board. So I think 27, you know, is, is a good number to start with. I think it's going to be a very popular place. And also West Pomeroy Lane is not a place to park by the side of the road. So, you know, we, we don't want to have overflow parking up on West Pomeroy Lane. It is just really a dangerous, narrow, uh, high-speed uh, connector. So, so I All guess right. I'm, right. I'm fine with that number. All right. Um, let's see, Nate, I'm going to call on you. Sure. Yeah. While the conversation was happening, I looked at uh, some aerial photographs of Conti. And so, you know, originally it was about 15 spaces there. And then in recent years, they added, I think there's about 35 now, you know, they have a pavilion um, near overlook near the parking, but they extended the parking. It was grass. And so I think that they responded to the, um, to the popularity by, you know, increasing the gravel parking. And so, you know, I think the number of spaces here, Dave's right, that this will be popular. So I think this is a good number to start with and we can see how it's how it's used uh, and then see what other future uses are proposed for the site but i think it would be i mean the the parking lot's already in existence so it would be seems strange to recommend fewer or to condition it with fewer i mean what we're what we're doing is you know trying to take you know take the existing parking lot and dave said to get some separation from the clubhouse but then you know have a, enough parking spaces to accommodate the use and so i don't I don't, I wouldn't recommend trying to condition it with a lower number. Yeah, I guess all I was doing was trying to say a lower minimum and giving you guys flexibility where you can have, you know, use more spaces or create more spaces without having to come back and tell us, you know, right. we need a, we need five more spaces. That just seems ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. I understood. I misunderstood that, Doug. I, I understand. I see. I understand that now, right? If you said a minimum, you can always do. Yeah, well, yeah like I mean, saying, right? you know, we don't seem to have any penalty for having more spaces in this town. Uh, but, you know, do we have to have a specific number now? Or could we just say, you know, you need to have at least 15 and, and uh, whatever, you know, if the demand warrants, you know, you should add more. <laughs> I, I like that flexibility and, and we certainly don't want to clog up the planning board's agenda with future agendas with coming back to ask for seven, eight more spaces. Yeah, so yeah, you know, that that was my thought. But I will I guess we'll see if anybody wants to go that direction. Um Janet, I do see your hand, but I'm gonna call on Chris first. I see hers too. Yeah, I just note that um I'm looking at the plan that um was prepared as part of this application for the parking lot and it does show accessible parking spaces three. So I think there was a question about whether there are two or three. Nate might be able to bring up that plan. It was the uh, proposed parking layout plan. Or, or Pam. <laughs> or Pam. I, I, I think, think it was the existing that we were talking about. Yeah, there's existing two and I think we proposed three. Proposed three, okay. Yeah. But existing yeah. currently right now two. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, Janet. So I, I was sort of thinking about Groff Park, which gets a lot of heavy use, and it seems to me kind of roughly the same size. And so I thought this was a 30 was a good number. But, I, you know, I don't see any reason to make it smaller because if it has a lot of use, then it's there. And I think we don't really know what the other side's being used for. And so it might be a situation where the parking lots between the two, the the recreational area and whatever that building turns into might be shared parking. So I think we're in a great situation where you can just move the Jersey barriers and, 
you know, whatever, but you know, what that other use is going to come back to us and we can relook at it. But it seems to me like, you know, Grav Park is very heavily used at certain times. It seems to be roughly the same amount of space. And, you know, I think, I think Dave's right that people are going to come to this park. It's very close to a lot of population areas. People will drive there because they don't really want to, there's no real sidewalky way to get to it from the village center or other parts of town. So I, I think, you know, let's just see how this sits and, you know, people are, we're going to come back, they're going to come back with the um, covered seating areas. And, you know, I think let's just not make it super complicated and just go with this number. All right, Janet. Uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, I do both. I would say uh, no fewer than 27. All right. Karen. Um, I, you know, no fewer than 20, that's saying you have to have 27. Um, I Let's just leave it flexible. This is, everybody is guessing what's happening and you don't want a lot of access parking if you don't have to, and you don't want to give them requirements that we know nothing about. So it gives them the leeway to do whatever they want if we say no fewer than whatever, um, 15 or whatever. All right, thanks, Karen. All right. Um, let's see. You want me to keep talking about the development application report? Yeah, I think we ought to finish that and go on. Uh, keep going, yeah. So the erosion control seems adequate because the Conservation Commission approved it. Um, the management plan talks about the management and it hits all the usual things. Um, we did have the issue about maintenance and we've already talked about that. Traffic impact statement wasn't really um, needed because there's not gonna be that much traffic added to West Pomeroy Lane as a result of this project here. Um, drainage was reviewed by the Conservation Commission and they agreed with what was being proposed. We haven't heard from the fire department or the town engineer, but I'm not sure that that's very important at this time. The fire department probably wouldn't have a lot to say about this project. And the town engineer has looked at it as part of the Conservation Commission review. So I think it's fine if you choose to approve this without hearing from either of them. Um, we already talked about some of the Design Review Board's comments. Um, one of their comments actually had to do with extending the um, side. Um, there are side kind of, uh, I don't even know how to describe them. To, oh, they're, they're curbs on the bridge? Yeah, they're like um, fence. They're sort of like fences along the bridge. And um, the design review board thought, it would be nice if those didn't just end at a 90 degree angle, but if somehow they ended at a 45 degree angle. Um, so that was something that they talked about, but then they really didn't actually make that statement in their um, recommendations. They just said that they wanted those bridges to be, um, and, and the trails to be ADA accessible. Mm -hmm. And then the Disability Access Advisory Committee was mostly concerned about how do you get here from elsewhere rather than, you know, they didn't really have too many comments, if any, about the project itself. They were more concerned with the fact that there really wasn't public transportation to get here. And that's not something that the planning board can do anything about. Um, but Dave did suggest that at some point in the future, it could be possible that um, perhaps the senior center van or something like that could be able to bring people here or one of the PVTA uh, vehicles. And then site furnishings, um, we were suggesting that when uh, a shade structure is decided upon, that it be brought back for your review and approval if you so choose. And you could say the same thing for the bench style. It, it depends on how much you wanna be involved with that. Um, and, and and is that comment superseded at all for by the need for the special permit now from the ZBA? Well, the special permit um, is it depends. I mean, if the if the planning board um, 
wanted to see the structure. I, I don't know if the ZBA is really that concerned about what the design of the of the structure is as they are about the placement of the structure in the FPC. So I suppose you could allow the ZBA to choose the structure style or you could make um, you could make that your um, in your bailiwick and then the ZBA would just be talking about the fact that there is a structure there. So it's really up to you how, how you want mm -hmm. to handle that. Okay. So uh, I guess when we get to the conditions, we can talk about that some more. Yep. Do you want to go to the conditions? I think no? so, yeah. Does anybody object to moving on to the conditions and findings? Don't see any objections. Pam, do you think you could bring up the, the draft that Chris sent out this afternoon, the revised conditions. And there we go. Yep. That's it. Yep. So it turned out that there were um, more waivers than we actually um, highlighted in the beginning. Um, but we did know about some of these. There was a waiver that they asked for from the lighting plan because they're not providing any lighting, um, a waiver from the traffic impact statement. Um, and then a sign waiver for signs that are over 12 feet in area. Now, some of these signs are three by four, um, and there are more than one of them. Three by four is obviously 12 feet, but in some places there are, you know, more multiple of these signs that are over 12 feet. So that's why we suggest that you could grant this waiver. And then um, signs in the RO zoning district are limited to four feet high. And some of these signs are indeed higher than four feet high. Um, if you wanted to, you could look at the um, detail sheet. I don't have those uh, exact images in my head. But anyway, those are two, uh, two waivers of sign requirements. And then um, there's also a requirement that there be not more than one or two signs exceeding 12 square feet in the FPC zoning district. I don't really know what the point of that was, but um, that's another waiver that you could choose to grant. Um, so I do want to talk about sign waivers now and then go on to parking waivers. Yep. Bruce. Um, it seems to me that the size of these signs uh, gen generated by the specific function here, which uh, is uh, perhaps an odd, uh, a non-normal thing for an RO district. I can see from having been to many of these places with three by four signs uh, that, that give context maps and things like that. Clearly, that seems to be a, a reasonable uh, or a certainly not excessive area. So I certainly uh, advocate for that waiver. And then as you go down to the next one, if you have a sign that's 12 feet, you don't, we don't really have to look at the uh, drawings, I don't think, because you can say if, if, even if that 12 foot square foot sign was sideways with a three foot vertical and four foot horizontal, if we had five, four feet limit, then the bottom of the sign would be a foot above ground, which would be good for dogs, but hopeless for humans. So clearly we need to uh, endorse that waiver as well. So I would argue uh, that it's almost, it's it's reasonable for granting the sign first sign waiver, and it's a, it's a no brainer, I suppose you could say, therefore to grant the second. I'm not sure about third, but it seems again that this is probably a function of the uh, the, the 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 information wayfinding uh, interpretations and aspirations for information exchange and education, and so I I would feel thoroughly comfortable then granting that waiver as well for, for that reason. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I can say that I share Bruce's sentiments about these three. Anybody else on the board want to weigh in? Um, OK. OK, uh, um, let me go to the parking waivers. Um, sure. There's a, park, a request for a waiver from Section 7.105, which is lighting of parking lots and then a waiver from section 7.112 for screening of parking lots and in this case it seems like the parking lot is kind of screened already by there's a big uh, kind of a berm along the road that screens the parking lot and there's also a lot of 
um, trees. So even though it's not immediately screened right around where the parking lot is, um, it is uh, in, in fact screened um, because of that mound and trees along the road. Well, and then Chris, from... do, Chris, does the does the bylaw require an actual screen that is a manufactured device or no. could we simply say in the findings that we think 7.112 is met because of the configuration of the topography and the vegetation? Um, I suppose you could say that. That's fine with me. That seems more defensible than just creating yeah. a waiver. Yeah. I, I, li I like the idea. Of, I like Doug's idea of, of, of advocating why mm -hmm. it's okay rather than uh, uh, basically taking a pass. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no waiver, but um, there is a reason uh, why it is actually screened. Sure. Um, and then a waiver from section 7.106, which has to do with the width of a two-way driveway. Um, it's supposed to be 18 feet wide. When I measured it on the GIS plan, the driveway that comes into the parking lot, it appeared to be more like 12 or 13 feet wide. But you can imagine that um, even though it is both an entrance and an exit, there probably aren't going to be lots and lots of cars coming out in and out, you know, at the same time. So a car could wait for another car to pass. So well, this is the kind of this is a this is a particular uh, requirement that I suspect the fire department is always interested in, because there are certain fire code requirements for uh, I think it's as much as 20 feet of access for fire trucks to at least respond to you know events at buildings. And now maybe that doesn't apply in this situation because there's no building to be protected or you know responded to. It does have to do with the um, protection of buildings and the and the driveway that is close to the clubhouse is much wider. It's like you know probably thirty feet wide. So okay. you could say that the driveway that's associated with the clubhouse is adequate. And the driveway that is associated with this parking lot for the trails doesn't really need to be 20 feet wide to accommodate fire trucks, in my right. opinion. Chris, I see Dave's hand. Uh, Dave, you have a thought about this? Yes, I was just going to kind of emphasize what Chris was saying, which is we're going to provide fire access. Dave froze. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give him a couple seconds. Gotta love Zoom. <laughs> All right, well, um, why don't I go ahead and call on Janet? She's the other hand at the moment. I'm, I'm starting to feel uncomfortable with this kind of deliberation or conversation. You know, it seems to me, you know, I'm looking through these sections, um, you know, it's like, it's possible that we could waive the screening requirement because of this kind of, you know, if, if it's three feet of a berm that, that meets our zoning requirement, it might be nice to have some hedges put there. So to screen the parking lot, I don't know what the, we don't have a landscape plan, um, but we're, you know, we're waiving that. Um, now we're waiving, you know, like if there's a car in the parking lot and fire, the fire truck would want to come in. And be able to get out or whatever. So I, I'm not comfortable waiving requirements just because I don't know why we're, you know, I, these are requirements I've just seen and we haven't heard from the fire department. This might be a big problem with them. We don't know. Um, you know, in fact, they are burning the building next door. They practice on it, you know, um, and the Jersey barriers would, pre you know, so I just, I just don't know what we're just sort of it looks like we're just hustling through the requirements of the bylaw to get to waive it for any reason. I just I just feel like I'm not quite sure how we got here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Dave, I see you're back. You're still muted at the moment. It looks anybody, like Dave's on his phone and now yeah, does anybody know how to tell what what Dave should do to unmute on his phone? 
push star nine. Star nine? I think so. Well, it's not doing it. Uh. Well, Nate, do you? One thing, uh, one thing I was going to mention is that the access, there's two entryways, and the other drive that goes directly to the clubhouse will still be there. So, you know, if there is um, emergency access needed to get to the structure or into the site, there is another way. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, you know, the what will be the parking law access, and then the, you know, what is going to be town of Amherst kind of restricted access. Okay. Um, Janet, is your hand still a legacy? Okay, Bruce. Um, I, I, I don't share Janet's concern that we are rushing through this. Um, I think uh, this is what we do, uh, and I don't uh, think that uh, we should be too concerned about. Uh, um, adding cost to the project because I, I think that we've got it. Uh, do I understand correctly um, that the 13 foot wide trajectory is already there yes. and that uh, we would be, we're considering saying that that is acceptable. So I don't think it's entirely arbitrary. I think it's a question of whether we want to uh, ask the applicant to indulge in, 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 in further uh, work that would be basically remain, mean that we'd have to build an 18-foot driveway when we've already got a 13-foot driveway there. So I don't think that's a good way to spend money uh, just to get an extra 18 feet because we might need it. I think uh, under the circumstances, we should accept that 13 feet is reasonable and if it takes a wave to do that, I would argue that we should do so. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Karen? I, I totally agree with Bruce. I don't think we're rushing through it. I think we know this uh, area and it just makes sense to not uh, spend a lot of time changing this. I think it's totally adequate. All right, thanks, Karen. Janet? So, you know, I could see not hearing from the town engineer because basically this place is covered with pathways. They're being removed. We're putting in pretty much pathways on pathways. Um, I don't think it's gonna affect the stormwater or the movement of water across the site, I think actually will improve it. You know, I have no idea what the Spire Department wants. And this is like the second thing we're saying, oh, we we, we don't, you know, it's like, I, I've, ne you know, so we don't know if this is adequate for a fire truck, but we feel like maybe it's okay because it's there. I just don't get it. You know, I, we, I, you know, I've been okay. on this. Okay, we hear you. <laughs> I've been on this board for five years and we hear reports and we make adjustments. Yeah. And you know, we don't hear reports and we just accept whatever is being put to us. I just don't get it. And okay. I want to vote for this project. I think it's an excellent project, but I'd like to have our ducks in order. Okay. Chris? I just wanted to say that we're very diligent about sending our transmittals to the town engineer and the fire department. And it's just a happenstance that they seem to be so busy recently that they have trouble responding. And so we have to make a judgment call about whether it's necessary to hear from them for a particular project or not. And in this case, I think the town engineer's work um, was involved with the Conservation Commission. So I believe that, uh, you know, that is adequate. And then I, I really felt that the fire department's work would be more concerned with um, whether the building had a problem or not. I, I didn't imagine that there would be a problem in the driveway. So, um, you know, I don't know what to say about this, but my recommendation would be to go along with it and say, it's, you know, the 13 foot driveway is, is okay for this particular situation. Okay, thanks, Chris. Bruce? Um, I was gonna say something more or less along the lines of Chris, but uh, I'll phrase it uh, differently. Uh, do we, do I correctly understand that uh, these uh, uh, these matters are forwarded to the fire brigade for their comments? And I think Chris said yes that they are. And then I guess I could say, do I correctly understand that the fire department would choose to respond to something that was important and might put a lower priority on something that was less important? And I'm 
uh, uh, do I therefore correctly understand that this uh, that this means that this is not so important to the fire brigade? And that what Nate said would make me understand that why should it be? Because the only possible problem that they might have there is a car on fire. And as Nate said, you can get to the parking lot much faster and much better by coming in the other side of the Jersey barrier. And I don't think the Jersey barrier is going to be a problem for a fire truck. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Janet, do you have anything new to say? I do. I mean, we have the assistant town manager here, and I think, you know, this is super frustrating to me. We did this on a Jones Library building with the fire department and the engineer and the strong house. And so it's like we need to we need the we need to get response from the town departments. I totally respect the work. I understand they're busy. I also understand Chris can't make them respond. But, you know, you know, let's let's we need to hear this we need this information regularly and not you know guessing that they didn't respond because it wasn't important or because they're busy i just we need we need we need something here that's not happening all right Thank so you. i was going to jump in dave texted and said he is having uh issues connecting i don't know if, if it'd be worth just having dave if you can hear us just um if you leave the meeting and try to come back i don't know if that would help but we can come back to this point if we'd want just to see i don't know if yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the, I mean, I think Janet's, based on the comments we've gotten, Janet's view is in the minority at the moment. Um, unless, you know, I mean, we haven't heard from everybody, but um, Chris, uh, I will say that you skipped over uh, waiver number seven. We went right to number eight. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so waiver could, number seven we is talk an about that for a minute and see if Dave can fix yeah. this problem. That's an existing condition. Um, the first um, 50 feet of the driveway, I think, or first 30 feet is supposed to be less than 5%. Um, in this case, we think it might be over 5%. We're not sure. We didn't do a calculation on that. But if in case, in the case it, that it is over 5%, um, you could grant a waiver for that. So this is a conditional waiver since we don't have a survey of the property and, and know what's really the case. Right. That's right. Nate might be able to figure it out on the fly. This just came to my attention this afternoon when I was talking to the building commissioner. Uh-huh. All right. Janet, is your hand up to talk about number seven? Okay. No? All right. Um, well, why don't you, why, uh, number nine, Chris, was uh, about landscaped islands? Yes, if you have a parking lot that's over 25 um, spots, then you're supposed to have landscaped islands that are four feet wide and with raised curves throughout the parking area. And we usually say that they should be every 10 spaces, but in this case, it didn't really seem to be necessary. Um, those are usually in places where you want a fairly manicured look to the situation. And in this case, it's not really a manicured look. And it's kind of a, I might even call it a temporary situation. I don't think, I mean, I projecting into the future is hard to do, but I think, you know, when this site gets developed as a whole, the parking lot is not gonna look the way it is does right now. So it'll probably be improved. So putting landscape islands in with curbs that are, who's going to maintain the landscape for one thing, but putting those in at this time, I don't feel is really um, necessary. So in the, in cumulative, I mean, you know, are we being asked to hold the town to a lower standard than any private uh, applicant would be held to here? Chris? Well, um, that's a good question. I think we're, we're mindful of how much money the town has available to do this project. They have money from grant sources. And when we start adding, you know, making the uh, parking lot look like a manicured parking lot and making the driveway 18 feet wide and redoing the slope of the entry drive to be less than 
you know, you're starting to add a lot of money to this project, and I don't think this project has that kind of money. Nate is more familiar with the budget than I am, um, but that would be my mm -hmm. my comment. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think outside parties could could have could view us as sort of being asked to, you know, waive a whole bunch of things that you know a private applicant would read the regs and show up. Hey, you know, I, 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 I'm here to show you that I've met the regulations. So um, maybe that's not a reasonable view, but I think it could be. Bruce and then Fred. Um, it's a good question that you asked, Doug. Uh, and I, common sense suggests to me that, uh, that as this has been explained, that this is part of the five acre developable portion of the land um, and uh, that therefore has a different uh, value. Um, my understanding is that this uh, uh, new development, they're putting their money where it makes sense, which is in the trails, and they're uh, upgrading or utilizing the existing uh, parking area at a reasonable level. Um, and I agree with Chris that uh, spending too much on this uh, when it may be uh, reconfigured, when the uh, when the second when the subsequent phase of what actually happens, you know, a, a really thoughtful use of, about how this uh, portion, this developable portion of the site is used, um, I think uh, this makes absolute sense. Uh, so, uh, the, so yes, it may be that uh, we are holding somebody to a, a, a lower standard than normal. Um, I'm not sure that that's true or not. I don't know, but it may be that it is true. But I think there's a very powerful logic for doing so. And uh, I definitely think in the public interest, um, welfare, safety, and uh, well, uh, uh, those three things that we are all about here, but uh, putting the uh, resources into the trail system and, and the uh, conservation uh, and restoration of the land is where we in good conscience should be putting. And I think it would be, uh, I would I would feel much more vulnerable to accusations that we are diverting town uh, public funds to do minimal uh, and pecuniary uh, uh, augmentation of, 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 of driveways and, and, uh, and parking with landscape islands. I think I would feel very uh, vulnerable to uh, public, uh, uh, vitriol for making that kind of a decision than creating a kind of precedent about uh, slightly diminishing the standards under these particular circumstances. So I'm comfortable with this set of uh, this set of waivers um, based on what I just said. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Um, so I see several hands from board members, but Dave, you are back, and I presume you know how to re unmute now. Um, do you want to make any sort of comment about where we're at? Sure, Doug. Can you hear me now? Yes. Apologies. Yeah, my uh, my laptop, uh, something happened there, so I'm on my phone. Um, yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I guess I've, I've missed some of this conversation trying to, uh, trying to reconnect, but um, I guess what the, the point I wanted to make was I, I think following up on something Bruce said is that if you look at this, we're looking at this, this project as a multi-phase, multi-year effort to, to, to develop the Hickory Ridge property to meet some of the goals of the town. Short term, the low hanging fruit really are the trails. Um, so we've proposed the improvements that we feel are safe, are provide accessibility and put money into resources, you know, within the the, the property um, that gets people out in this this naturally beautiful place. Um, when the town decides to redevelop or develop the available five, five and a half acres into what it it wants the, the highest and best use, I think Obviously, we would come back to the planning board and various other boards and committees to have that be reviewed, and we would expect a much higher standard. 
Uh, I think Janet uh, referred to shared parking. I fully anticipate that, say for instance, if it's decided to put a South Amherst fire station on the, the site where the, the clubhouse is now or approximately there, that why would we repave, you know, uh, you know, two and a half acres of, of land when we could share parking with, you know, the open space parking, the trail parking and uh, overflow parking, say, for staff of the of the new fire station. So we fully expect to come back to you and meet those higher standards. But right now we feel as though we presented a project that that um, and, and we had to consider asking for the waivers that that uh, Chris has outlined. So. That's, I think, where we are. Okay, thank you, David. Um, let's see, so in order, I see Bruce and then Fred and then Jesse, and I suspect Bruce is a legacy, is that true? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Fred, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I. Um, First of all, I think I'm I'm 100% in favor of the 7.111 waiver from the landscaped islands and all of that. I don't have a problem with that. I think I may have a bit of a problem with 7.102 and 7.106 because the way I see it, to some extent, there's a public safety issue in terms of... Uh, being able to navigate the end of a driveway and uh, and the width of a driveway that may accumulate some two-way traffic. So I, I guess my attitude is a little more nuanced. I, I'm, I'm totally in favor of the waiver on the interior islands and so on, but, and, and I'm not sure that uh, the, like the, the, uh, uh, drive uh, the uh, uh, slope of the entry drive I don't think it's a it's it's much different than five percent I would think with heavy equipment that should be a, a comparatively uh, inexpensive fix if it's if, if it's even off at all uh, and I think it could be widened a little bit again in uh, not much time with some heavy equipment that the town owns. Uh, so I would, I would, I think we ought to look at the, the seven and eight maybe differently than the way we look at uh, uh, number nine. Okay. Thank you, Fred. Jesse? Yeah, basically, I was going to agree with what Fred just said. Now that David's back, did you hear our questions about the width and from a safety standpoint? Do you have any contact with engineers or fire about that yet? We have we have not heard back from the fire department or the town engineer on that. Um, I, no, we we have not. Um, I I will, yeah. Then I'll just echo. I feel like those are important ones before we waive it to just feel confident that there's not a safety issue. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Janet. So I think I am going to repeat myself because I think Dave missed it. I just I feel like this is our second application where we haven't heard back. The planning board hasn't heard back from departments. And I'm thinking, oh, Dave's like the assistant town manager. And so, you know, it's it's like I don't want to wave something because it might need waving, but we, no one's measured something or we haven't heard back from the fire department. I have lots of firemen in my in my family. And I, I think, you know, if we're not hearing back from the departments, we can't make decisions. And if the town wants us to make a decision quickly, which I completely support, we need to hear back. And so, you know, I'm making a plea. I don't know if on behalf of the board that we need to hear from town staff. Um, we can't just waive the bylaw because we haven't heard anything or assume that there's no problem because we haven't heard anything. So I, you know, and in a situation like this, you want a permit from us, we want to give it to you and we don't have enough information. And if we're just going to wave and wave and wave without, you know, it's just, it's just such a bad precedent to me and I'm super frustrated. I don't know kind of why I'm here at some point. All right. Thanks, Janet. Chris. 
Um, I was just going to suggest that you could continue this public hearing to a date certain in the future, and we can try to talk to the fire department about at least um, number eight here with regard to the width of the driveway. And um, I'm not sure that number seven relates to the fire department, but if it does, I can ask them about that question as well. I think, I think seven is more related to the town engineer myself. It's a so sort of roadway and traffic. I, which I assume is the town engineer's purview. I don't know, yeah. maybe there's somebody right. else. That... So ask the town engineer about number seven and ask the fire department about number eight. That's what I would think. I see Dave's hand. Dave, do you have other thoughts? Uh, no, I just wanted to echo what Chris said. You know, we're happy to take these questions back and and if the board would be willing to continue this public hearing, we would be happy to come back to a date certain, you know, uh, that works in your schedule and have these questions addressed. Okay, great. Well, that seems to be where we're headed. Uh, Chris, do you want to, I mean, you want to go through the conditions? Yeah, I think we ought to talk about yep. as much as we can tonight mm -hmm. and whatever, whenever we come back at a date certain, we can have as short a conversation as possible. Okay. Um, so the first two conditions are pretty standard project shall be built according to plans approved by the planning board on whatever date you approve them on and the project. Uh, Chris, I, I still see Dave's hand and I don't know if it's a legacy. So, okay, it's gone. Go ahead. Okay. So that's um, according to the plans approved on X date. And then the project shall be managed according to the management plan approved by the planning board on X date. So those are kind of standard things that you usually apply. Um, then uh, the hours of operation shall be from dawn to dusk. That's pretty standard for this type of um, facility that the town owns. So I think that's a reasonable condition. Um, the fourth one is changes to the project or substantial changes to any approved site plans shall be submitted to the planning board for review and approval prior to the work taking place. And the purpose of the submittal is for the planning board to approve the change and determine that the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the site plan review approval. And that's another one that's pretty standard. Um, the fifth, number five, proposed shade structure and sign designs shall be submitted to the planning board for review and approval after review by the design review board and prior to installation. That's another thing that is um, that you often put in with regard to those types of um, structures and uh, and signs. And then um, the sixth one relates to this issue that we just discovered. I think it was either today or yesterday. All time is melding into one day to me. But um, in any event, it occurred to us because of another project that we're working on that um, structures in the FPC need approval from the um, Zoning Board of Appeals. And I talked to the building commissioner and he agreed that the shade structure, the bridges and the boardwalks are all considered structures, at least um, with regard to um, the building code, but we don't, have a, uh, we don't have a definition of structure in our zoning bylaw, unfortunately. So, um, we suggest that you approve the site plan review and then um, make a condition that uh, the applicant has to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals to get the special permit for those structures in the FPC. Um, so those were all the conditions that I came up with. Were there others that we decided along the way here? I don't remember. Well, um, let me ask you about number six. Um, why do we need to put in a condition that, that basically says follow the zoning the zoning bylaw? You don't need to. It's just if people need reassurance that this is actually going to occur. Okay. Um, Janet. Um, so on number five, you know, if the ZBA is going to look at the location of the shade structure. Um, and that's in their purview. I'm sort of happy to defer to them how it looks. I don't think that, you know, they do, you know, they it just doesn't seem like we have to approve the look and they approve the location. That seems kind of repetitive. And can we just cede that to them just to handle shade structures so you don't have to 
be showing us pictures and then them locations and things like that. Yeah, I mean, we certainly could. I think traditionally the planning board has more architectural and landscape expertise and the zoning board has more to do with what kinds of things are appropriate in certain zones. So, Bruce? No, oh, firstly, I agree with uh, you, Doug. I, I think I will, uh, I agree with what I think you agree with, which is that number six is unnecessary. Um, uh, uh, as far as the number five is concerned, and the, uh, um, my understanding from the uh, conversation today at the uh, site visit, I think it might have been during that, was that these shade structures haven't yet been designed maybe they have i can't remember because i'm not looking at the drawing set right now i think i clearly remember that the budget is not in place to build these right now so it's possible that they haven't been finally designed so that being the case if that is the case then it would be therefore that the zoning board would not be in a position to do a, a good review of the design if they haven't been designed so that being the if that is the case, then I would suggest that we maintain uh, that we we retain this uh, number five. Okay. So maybe the question is: Is my supposition correct? Are the is the shade structure uh, designed uh, fully uh, uh, evident in the in the in the documentation? Because if it is, then I would say yes. That's probably could we could defer to the zoning board. Although I'd prefer for them to come back. But Chris, if it's Chris. not designed, they can't. Chris, is, is they have not been designed. Um, we've given you um, three ideas about what they might look like, but they haven't been designed. Yep. So it sounds like you would prefer to keep number five and eliminate number six. Is that right? Yeah, I, I yep. think so. I guess I'm going to ask a question kind of about the context for this whole site plan review. Um, you know, when I look at the uh, Dodson and Flinker drawings, there's nothing in here about the parking area. Nope. The, the parking layout seems to be a separate pr pr product of perhaps town staff. Mm -hmm. Could we approve the work that Dodson and Flinker is showing and not act on the town parking lot? And simply say the context for this zoning, for this uh, site plan review is the work that Dodson and Flanker is doing? It's a good question. I like that. Because. Could we ask him to come back on yeah, the. I mean, I mean, I guess you, 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 the town wants you guys, the town wants to put some Jersey barriers on the parking lot. And I know when we were looking at that pot production facility down in down, down on Hall Drive, you know, we we made that guy come back and uh, I think we ended up saying that the you know we that the most of those concrete barriers he had on that property were de minimis and we didn't even really require a new site plan review. I mean, I know we talked about the barriers he had out at the street. So, you know, you don't really want to do anything to the parking lot right now, except have Guilford drop some Jersey barriers there. Should we just not, to, not go there? <laughs> Nate, what do you think? Could, could I suggest that we just approve, you know, what we can approve and just say, come back to us on the parking lot and things like that. Can we do a partial? You can't I mean, I, I think I would, and review. No. Yeah, I would. I think continuing the hearing, if you need more information to approve the parking lot, essentially the site plan is approving any, um, you know, any improvements to the to the property, even even the smaller changes to the parking. So, you know, we are essentially demarcating a new parking area. There's a new new layout uh, in terms of handicap parking and then access with a trail. And so, you know, I'd rather have that be part of the approval. The Dotson plan, when the town contracted with Dotson, it really was for the trails, right? So that's really what we, we were hoping um, to understand. While that was happening, it came to light that the parking lot needs improvements you know, in terms of resurfacing, 
accessibility improvements to get to the trails. And that wasn't originally part of their scope uh, or the budget. And so, I mean, I, I think I agree that while this is happening, we're also looking at, as Dave mentioned, a comprehensive plan for the site. So, you know, the parking lot may, you know, maybe temporary, that could be a few years, right? But the idea would be to come up with what is a future use for the, that, that area that um, isn't in the floodplain, whether it, you know, remains the way it is for now, uh, is there, as Dave mentioned, a few other possible municipal uses, the housing trust is eager to look at that area. Um, and so, you know, we had, we had never envisioned coming up with a formal parking design, thinking that at some point it would probably be changed to accommodate a different, different use on that higher area. But I think the site plan really approves everything that's being proposed, all the work being proposed. So, okay. All yeah. right. All right. So, um, you know, I think we're headed toward a continuation here. Um, any, but any other hands? I don't see any at the moment. Johanna? Um, if we can't make it through tonight and need a continuation, I would just be interested to hear from what impact that might have on any grants the town is raising to make this project. Right. Yeah. Well, I think our next meeting is January 3rd, assuming we hold it. Um, Chris or Dave, do you want to comment on if we go to early January? It, it sounded like that was not an issue. Dave? Can you hear me, Doug? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I would favor a continuance um, to give us more time to investigate those those few options about the the requests we made. Um, to Johanna's point or question, um, I have not heard any significant um, concerns or or requested changes to the trail system, and that's really what we need to get out to bid. Mm -hmm. So. If I'm hearing the board members correctly, it's your concerns are really about the parking lot, parking access from West Pomeroy, those kinds of things. They are not part of the grant funding or the bid for the most part, the bid, I think Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but they would not be part of the bid at all really. So um, I'm pretty confident that a continuation would not uh, to sometime in January would not negatively impact our, our bidding. Okay. Great. That's good news. Uh, I, yeah, I will say that we don't have a budget at all for significant improvements or changes to the parking areas. So, uh, and, and the grant will not, the grants will not pay for those. So we're, we're going to try to answer all of your questions, uh, with the expertise from the fire department and uh, town engineering. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess one other thing that I, I could ask whether you considered, which was for now, maybe putting Jersey barriers along the edge of the existing clubhouse and leaving the parking lot with two points of access, one of which is wide enough and probably sloped adequately and the other one, which is somewhat substandard, but has been there for 65 years. Dave? So yeah, we, we, we did consider that. Um, we came up with this new plan, which we thought was based on safety about getting people, visitors, et cetera, away from the clubhouse. But I think if you continue this hearing, we will go back to the drawing board a little bit and look at, at that, maybe going back to the drawing board, shall we say, a okay. little bit on access to the site. So we're okay. happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Bruce? Um, just reminding you, Doug, that there was another condition that we discussed as a possible, and that was uh, minim uh, putting a, a, a minimum on the parking. Um, I yeah, don't uh, necessarily yeah. support that, but uh, I, I I thought some may, may and uh, it now would be the time. Right. It seemed like, you know, by the time the conversation was over, 
you know, everybody or most people were comfortable with using the 27 spaces and the 380A spaces. And uh, I'm certainly not going to push the, that issue any further if, you know, I didn't hear a groundswell of support. I think I did hear a couple of at least one person saying that was, was good. But, you know, it's clear the town is going to be back whenever they decide to invest some more money in this. So all of that can be revisited. Okay, um, Chris, anything you want to say about your extensive possible findings on this document? No, I just wanted to ask the board if they felt that it was necessary to go through all of those findings and come up with reasons why each one was found, or um, is this the kind of project that would be uh, suitable to say that the project meets the relevant criteria? I would be happy to go through all of the findings, not tonight, but um, by January 3rd, if you want that to be done. I didn't have time to do it for tonight. Right. Um, so why don't you let me know? Um, yeah. Sometimes you manage the more simple projects by just saying this project meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24, but some, but most of the time we go through all the findings. So it's right. up to you. Okay. Bruce? I think I'm comfortable with the first. I mean, I haven't been on the board that long, so maybe, uh, but I do, uh, and maybe I'm uh, affected by the protocols and practices of 25 years ago when I was on the board for seven years. Um, and, uh, but it, it, but it does seem to me, and I'll make one point on this, that, you know, we are a board, uh, we have a certain amount of time available to us. We've got a lot to do in that time. So in the interest of uh, optimizing the, the, uh, the, the use and the value of our time, I'm inclined to think that uh, the one line is sufficient. I'd be interested to hear whether others agree. Okay, Bruce. Uh, Karen? Totally agree. I agree with Bruce. Okay. And I, I guess I was thinking, you know, we could leave, we could sort of leave the meeting at the moment with the agreement that we would just have the single line uh, but if anybody reads through that section and, and thinks otherwise, uh, you know, between now and whenever we continue this conversation, um, and preferably far enough in advance of the conversation that uh, staff can respond uh, with the individual comments, um, you know, we could, we could proceed in that way too. Okay, um, Chris, were there any other documents you wanted us to get through uh, on this topic? I don't believe so, um, okay. other than to acknowledge that um, I sent you a memo with regard to how um, this project met the requirements of Article 16, which you don't need to... Um, vote on that, but I think it's it's necessary to acknowledge that it meets the requirements of Article 16 because Article 16 talks about, um, you know, whenever you do any activities within the 100-year flood zone that you are supposed to permit it. And mm -hmm. so here we are permitting it by the Conservation Commission issuing an order of conditions and eventually the planning board issuing a um, site plan review approval. And then, of course, we have the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals that would be issuing its um, special permit for those structures. So uh, I will um, revise that memo now that we know that the Zoning Board of Appeals has a role here, too. But that's the only thing that I wanted to um, make sure that you knew and that you acknowledge that. Okay, great. All right, so uh, it does, uh, actually, Janet, I see your hand. So Chris, I was, I was, you know, I, I know this um, section is brand new and it took you 10 years to achieve it. And so um, I was like, oh, we're finally, we're applying it. So do I understand from you that the staff has looked at these very flat, you know, pathways that basically 
are going to be replicating the existing CLAD pathways almost completely and adding a few more and taking away some um, is not going to result in any increase in flood levels within the community. So it seems like we have to make a finding that this analysis has been done and there's no you know negative impact on the um, flood the flood zone. So it, I think when I read your email before, it's like you you all looked at that and made that determination. So, and then we need think, a finding on that, right? I think that is a determination that the Conservation Commission made um, when they okay. issued their order of conditions. But if you want to make that finding as well, I think we could do that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I thought that, I thought that your email was suggesting, but you're, if the CONCOM has done that, I'm good. Okay, okay. all right. All right, thanks, Janet. Okay, um, so is it simple, is it, is it adequate for me to make a motion that this hearing be continued to a date certain? Uh, and we, you can give me some suggestions about the date and time. I know we were planning to talk about whether we needed to have a January 3rd meeting. And, um, you know, was you had, I know you had hoped that we would not meet so that you could catch up on minutes. Um, so, you know, I, I guess part of the question has to do with how urgently the town would like us to finish this up. Uh, and, you know, Dave sounded like some anytime in January is probably fine, but, you know, I'm not sure whether you really need our sign off to uh, to issue your bid or whether you can prepare the bid and go out to bid even before we're done. Well, a couple of things from me. Um, one is that um, January 17th is not a reasonable date to continue this hearing to because we have the Fort River School coming up and that's a huge project and it's gonna take probably at least two meetings to get through that. Um, and then there's also the issue of the Zoning Board of Appeals needing to approve these structures in the FPC zoning district. So I would say it's either January 3rd or it's February 7th, I think, is the next possible mm -hmm. date. And for so far for February 7th, we don't have any um, public hearings. Uh -huh. So, Well, um, in terms of your workload and priorities, uh, which do you prefer? Speaking for myself, I think January 3rd would work, but I have two colleagues who also um, participate with me, and one of them is taking all of next week off, and the other one is taking um, a few days next week off. So I will be here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be here, and I think I can manage to um you know get the get the packets out at least um well I mean, you know, nate nate and i or i guess pam will be back on thursday so pam uh -huh. and i can get the packets out if it's just this project or maybe if it's this project and the continuation of the topic that we haven't gotten to yet um i think we can manage it but let me see yeah. pam's face is pam looking very Crit Crit this is Dave. Sorry to jump yes. in. I, I had my hand up, Doug. Chris, yes. I, I would just advocate, I think January 3rd is not realistic. We we need to get the fire department. We need to talk to the town engineer. Next week is a holiday week. I, I just think it's it's unrealistic to think we will turn this around and have adequate preparation for the board by January 3rd. I think I don't feel comfortable we can do that, so. Okay, well, it could be January I, 31st. We have a, a third meeting scheduled for January. I, I think that's fine. Um, Nate, if Nate would just chime in. I, uh, Nate, are you in agreement that if these are really issues to do with access in the parking lot, the bid for the, the trails themselves can still go out? Yeah, I, I had raised my hand and lowered it thinking, um, that the third wouldn't be adequate time to speak to the engineer, you know, if they're on vacation or out or. And, and, and uh, we, and if we need to come up with an alternative plan, uh, uh, go back to kind of the original plan of having access via the, the current entrance, which is closer to the clubhouse, that'll take a little time to draw and, and, and bring together. So I think, I think the end of January is much more realistic if the board is, is agreeable to that. 
Yeah, I was, I was going to say, Ray, I, I haven't heard many concerns about the trail layout itself or benches or other things. And that's really what we're bidding. I think, like Dave mentioned, it's, you know, the parking lot uh, to the road is what the town's doing. The trails are what the contractor is doing. So I feel comfortable that, you know, we're trying to um, have bids um, be publicized in early January, just so we can have someone under contract as soon as possible. But it doesn't, you know, the Conservation Commission has reviewed this. And so the trail locations are pretty, uh, you know, they approve those. And since I'm not hearing any concern tonight, I feel like comfortable that we can go ahead with getting bid documents together. Uh, and then the 31st doesn't really delay, delay that. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So uh, 635 on, do we want to go to January 31st or February 6th or something? 7th? February 7th. Chris, do you care? I'd say that January 31st is okay with me. Is it okay with um, Pam and Nate? Yeah. Okay. Pam, I'm we not hearing. Now, keep talking. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's absolutely fine with me in terms of you know, availability. We just have to be mindful of the idea that we're going to then again have back to back meetings. So we just ha have to be thinking about what we have going on the seventh, which at this time is nothing. Right. But I suspect the Fort River School is going to can come back too. Mm -hmm. It it could. Yeah. Bruce. I second your motion, Doug. The motion I haven't made yet. <laughs> I Thank think you, you have. <laughs> so, uh, so a motion to continue to six thirty-five on January thirty-first. Second. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Chris and Pam, you have that noted. Mm -hmm. All right. I do. We'll Any comments on on the the motion on the table, Janet? You are muted. Did was it seconded? I was going to second. Yes, Bruce. Bruce got in there. Okay, ahead of time. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Then we'll go through a roll call, uh, starting with you, Bruce. Uh, I approve. And Fred. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Okay, it's unanimous to continue this hearing to January 31st at 635. Uh, great. Dave, any, any last thoughts? No, I just want to thank the board for their input and we will work hard during the month of January to address the, the concerns and questions you raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, the time is 9.36. And the next item on our agenda, I believe, was continuing the, the potential hope housing overlay zone along University Drive. Uh, given the hour, may, we may, this is not a hearing. We are not obligated to talk about this very long or at all. Um, I am wondering whether we really want to do this or whether we just want to uh, move along and conclude the evening and come back maybe on January 3rd, which is the conversation we still want to have is, will we meet on January 3rd? Uh, Karen, I see your hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that I had my hand up, but I think we should try not to meet on January 3rd and give um, our staff some time off to finally do the minutes and just not keep overwhelming them. Okay, Janet? Um, I was gonna suggest that we put this discussion off to the January 31st meeting, because I think that we're gonna wrap up Hickory quickly. <laughs> I'm definitely not in the mood to talk about the overlay district, which I'm excited about, but not at the moment. I'm okay. just- All right, uh, Johanna. Um. I like hear the ghost of planning board members past saying you have to approach this issue of housing with urgency. 
And so there's part of me that wants to spend 20 minutes and just time cap ourselves at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. to re discuss the proposed consensus agreement and okay. take it from there. All right. Um, Karen, I see your hand again. Right. Sorry, sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Nate. Yeah, I was going to um, just uh, kind of um, along the lines of what Johanna said, if if not tonight, you know, Bruce had uh, synthesized the, the notes and then I had redrawn possible boundary changes. And so whether or not it's discussed tonight, you know, to think about those, you can always send comments to staff and we can, um, you know, we can combine those and and then get those distributed before the next time we discuss it. So if, if you know, if we're not going to have a discussion tonight, individual members can also take notes on their own. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm tired. I don't want to talk about this tonight. Right. Um, uh, but I am also feeling some urgency to get this worked out and sent up to town council. Um, you know, we are going to have Fort River School. We're going to have a design, a design standards consultant coming on sometime in the spring, we think, um, to help us with design standards for downtown, which will be a, you know, 18 month or two year process, a pretty heavy lift for staff. And so if we don't, if we don't do this soon, it, you know, it's probably not going to happen for a while. And I am, I, I guess, like Johanna, I'm feeling, I'm hearing the people saying, you know, we have a housing crisis, do something. And, um, you know, it's really up to us to generate some stuff. So I see three hands. Uh, actually, Chris, I'm going to let you go first. Okay. I was just going to say we could piggyback this onto the Fort River School. Um, sometimes you get into the middle of a really big public hearing and you realize that you have many questions and the um, public hearing has to be continued. So it could be that there would be time on the 17th to talk about this particular issue for, okay. you know, 45 minutes to an hour at the end of that meeting. So okay. I think that's what I would say. I, I personally am not um, feeling like delving into something that's complicated right now. And I, I think looking at your faces that others aren't as well. So um, I would suggest put it on at the end of the 17th and we'll see if we get to it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That seems like a good idea. Jesse. Uh, I kind of want to split the difference and ask Nate to give us five minutes on what, what changed just so we can think about it for the 17th. But I like Chris's okay. idea a lot. About All right. 17th. Sure. Well, I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'll just, I'll just, yeah, I'll give my elevator pitch. No, I think Bruce's document is, is nice. Uh, and in summary, I think there were some consensus points. I mean, so what I'd like to do then for the next meeting would be actually start to fill out, you know, kind of um, a template bylaw. And after the meeting, uh, the recent discussions, my, my thought would be to call this something, whether it's like, you know, like an economic and housing, um, housing and economic development overlay because of the kind of the discussion about trying to keep commercial, right? So the idea would be that the name of the overlay is intentional and then the purpose and the goals of it are reinforced and work their way down. And so I think what, you know, what I've heard is that um, we don't want to limit housing to, um, you know, student housing. So we're actually, you know, actually in the opposite, we're, we're going to allow apartments and mixed use buildings, maybe not allow the student dormitories, or if they are, would be by special permit, but other things would be by site plan review. We like the idea of additional stories, um, we like the idea of having um, a pretty high percentage of first floor uh, requirement of being non-residential space. And so, you know, that doesn't, it could be that other things, are, you know, there's more on upper floors of non-residential, but we'd have a requirement for first floor. Um, you know, what Bruce had said, what the things that aren't kind of resolved are the details, the setbacks, uh, some architectural design standards. I think those are things staff could work on. I think it will be different. For instance, the west side, there is the access drive. And, you know, the, the right of way is actually really wide on that section of street, but it's off centered from the road. So Swift Way is in the right of way. And then there's still a lot of other space on the east side. 
uh, a lot of it's wet. But on the west side, for instance, I think we almost want, gosh, it could be, you know, a 12, 15, 18 foot setback to allow for that second pedestrian, you know, off street uh, corridor. And so, you know, I think that we we can look at that and say, OK, that's what we would want. Um, you know, I still think four floors with a step back to a fifth floor. And so, you know, not five floors straight up the street, you know, right up on the facade, but it would be step back. Um, I think recommending aligning curb cuts with the other side of the street. So we have um, reduced user conflicts between vehicles and pedestrians, um, you know, considering what kind of open space amenities requirements we would have. I, you know, right now it's looking to me like we wouldn't have a full build out like BG, but it'd be more like, um, you know, 70% or something, you know, lot coverage and building coverage would be something, um, half space minimum parking requirements. So I, you know, I, I do think that all those pieces were, were really well taken. Um, I would apply inclusionary zoning, maybe have a little bit bigger requirement in terms of getting higher AMI. That would be a local uh, program, not something that is run through the state. And so, you know, just putting all those pieces down, you know, I think the difficulty is how the, you know, sometimes it's like how prescriptive do you want an overlay to be, right? We could, we can essentially take pieces from the existing bylaw and put it together, or we could come up with something really creative, or we could be really prescriptive, or do we, we, do we, do we have uses, dimensional standards, and a few, a few guidelines, and, and, and that's where it goes. Um, or do we get really prescriptive in terms of architecture and what we want? And you know, I think that's a discussion. And I think I think it goes, I think it can go either way. I, I do think that this is a really great opportunity where there's um, room for density and infill. I still I want to make sure it's what we we think we're gonna get what we want in terms of appearance and aesthetics. And so, you know, I sent those pictures around of new development. And so I haven't heard from anyone, but I just want to make sure we're not. You know, we're not thinking we're going to get 19th century buildings, you know, you know, like what we see behind me, right? Or like brick buildings with granite lintels and all this stuff. What we might get is like live 155 in Northampton, where it's a modern building. And maybe we want to see some relief in architecture, some detail along the roof line, um, a parapet or whatever, you know, some overhangs. Um, but I think this is a, a nice... Um, a nice overlay. I think we have to consider, do we want like townhouse style development or is it going to be mostly bigger unit develop, you know, bigger multifamily buildings uh, like apartments or mixed use. And so if so, how do we write that in? Um, yeah. And I, I think those are the, the, the pieces uh, that would be discussed. And so, you know, as an overlay again too, it's voluntary. So I just think anything that's allowed now, there's already a number of kind of zoning districts, uh, that could still happen. And then the boundaries, we asked about why include the Jones property north of Amity Street, but you know, that that one house on the corner is zone BL. And so not including in the overlay is fine, but then there's this little part of BL that's not in the overlay. And then in the new map, I didn't include Hawkins Meadow or the auto shop next to it. I did, you know, it's interesting, right? If we had the overlay, are we incentivizing changing Hawkins Meadow when right now it might be working fine, but I still kept the properties on both all quadrants of that intersection. And so again, there was a discussion point around that. So I think the boundaries are important. And, you know, I think kind of having that purpose and goals, I think we're working through them. And to me, if the idea is to keep student or housing opportunity and economic development, then those are, that's kind of, to me, those are the two pieces we'd want to reinforce with the overlay. And so what are the, have goal statements that do that have, maybe new definitions if we need them and dimensional standards and guidelines that get us there. All right. I didn't time you, but I think you hit five minutes. All right. Uh, so we have homework and we're going to skip class on January 3rd, I think. But we'll, we'll be back on the 17th. All right, um, so I guess I need to run through the rest of the agenda here. Um, uh, but first, are we finished? Have we, have we, we're done with the housing overlay for t this evening? Any objections? All right. Um, 
other housing issues? I think this was related to some of the concerns that Jesse had, had raised. Uh, I, I, anything we would need to say tonight? Okay. Uh, old business, Chris, anything? No old business, no. Any, how about new business, anything? Not reasonably anticipated. New business, we're putting our planner position back out um, for hoping that someone will be interested in coming to work with us because we're such a fun group to work with and we have <laughs> really interesting work to do. So hopefully that'll go out in the next couple of weeks and we'll get a new vibrant ed energetic person. Okay. In the department. All right. Form A, A and R subdivisions. Oh, Maybe Nate wants to say something about new business, which oh, yeah? is Nate. There, yeah, I think the design standards, Chris. Yes. Yeah. So the town did. Uh, there was a review committee. The town selected Dodson and Flinker, uh, and there uh, the contract was is was actually executed today. So I think we're moving that along pretty quickly. The hope to have a meeting in January, a meeting or two, just to get that going, um, and we'll keep everyone. Um, up to date on that so you know initially it'll be meeting with staff and kind of laying out the schedule and process and you know what what you know how do they how do they envision the you know next three months going in terms of public outreach and documentation and, and everything so we're pretty excited uh, we had three responses all qualified firms Dodson really had a nice thorough response they really understood the scope of work and what we're asking and context uh, and they've actually you know they've done this uh, in Northampton and other communities they were they were one of the respondents that had really solid uh, visuals and and zoning and you know narratives to accompany their graphics. So we're pretty pleased with that. All right, great. Um, okay, back to the form A and R. Anything? The form no? A's. Nothing. No. All right, ZBA applications. Anything? I have no report. Okay. Um. Planning board, oh, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUBs. Other well, than we know the, that we have Fort a River school, school. school yeah. coming on the 17th. Yep. And that is a big one. Yep. Okay. Very exciting. It's beautiful. It went to the design review board the other night and they were very pleased with it. They didn't have any negative comments and they really liked the design. It's it's really quite lovely, quite graceful. Um, is, there, is there a traffic report associated with this? There is a traffic report. There is because I know I've, I've heard sort of mutterings that there's concern among some people that this, that putting the school here in is going to really snarl traffic in that basic part of town. So uh, is does the traffic report seem comprehensive enough? Um, I would say I'm going to reserve judgment on that <laughs> okay uh bruce hi on that subject i uh, attended the uh, design uh, the building committee meeting as i have for the past three years on this project and i mentioned uh, the likely concern that this board would have uh, in that uh, on that subject so i'm sure they'll be prepared i it's a uh, one of the things I mentioned to them was that uh, the concerns for the traffic that the project has had uh, in in the past has been uh, evaluation of the tra traffic uh, challenges and so forth associated with the Wildwood site versus the Fort River site. So it was a, an assessment of uh, traffic related to choosing a site. And I wanted to make sure that they uh, changed their focus to and not that particular concern, but uh, how it would work here. I'm sure they'll be prepared. They, as Chris said, this is uh, an exceptional uh, design uh, team. Uh, they really are good. Good. Great. Okay, moving on to planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, PVPC, Bruce, anything you want to say? Uh, well, there was a meeting uh, and, and, uh, they had uh, 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 <laughs> basically a presentation on battery energy storage systems, uh, uh, quite elaborate actually, and and uh, the 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 uh, uh, 
I don't want to go into too much on this, but there's a model ordinance that's being produced, and uh, um, and uh, the other thing is that I mean it's been produced. It, it's it's probably something that Janet knows a little bit about, or maybe a lot about. But uh, the the uh, PVPC are, are are supporting uh, the towns in this, and also the district local technical assistance uh, deadline's been extended. And and one of the points in which they uh, offer funding assistance is uh, related to housing. I'm sure Nate, you've looked at this, but I just thought. I'd mention it because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's it. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, for CPAC, I have been attending weekly meetings on Thursdays, and um, I think we have our next meeting tomorrow. Uh, I think it may be the last meeting. Uh, I want to give a lot of credit to Dave Zomek and some of the other town staff, including Chris, for basically here finding out what the original complete set of asks were. And once you know they understood what the shortfall was, coming back and prioritizing the town asks so that I think that we're probably gonna be able to fund kind of everything that's left is kind of what it looks like to me. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens and you're welcome to tune in. Karen, anything on uh, DRB? Yeah, so I missed that meeting that Chris was talking about, about the school, because I was uh, in the air at that time. So I'm sorry, I I don't have anything to say. Okay. You're not going to tell us how, how Hawaii is, huh? <laughs> right now, it's cold and windy and rainy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Just like here. Okay, uh, CRC, Chris, <laughs> anything? You're smiling. <laughs> CRC. I haven't been to a CRC meeting recently, but the town council did refer the solar bylaw to the CRC. Maybe Janet mentioned this last time with the um, request that they report back by sometime in June, I believe. In June. Okay. So a pretty long <laughs> period. Wow. Okay. Hopefully it'll be sooner than that. All right. All right. Great, so the time now is 9.55 and I don't have a report other than to say it's been a great 2023 with all of you. I hope we have as equally or better a time in 2024. Have a good rest and uh, of January 17th. Chris, anything from you? Thank you and happy holidays and we'll look forward to seeing you in mid-January. All right. Anybody have anything else? Thank you to the staff. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Time is 9.55, and I think we are adjourned. Good thank night. You. Bye. Bye. All right. Good night, Pam. Good night, Mr. Marshall. Yes, I want to. Have a good holiday.